This happened to me when I was 15. My dad ran a wrecker service for over-the-road truckers. Late one night, we got a call that a truck had run off the road and struck a tree 20 miles south of town. So my dad and I fired up the wrecker and headed south. When we came onto the scene, the truck and the trailer had run off the road to the right and smacked a tree head on. It was one of those 100-year-old oak trees. This was back in the day when there was a cab over semi-trucks, or one of those without noses, or the engine is under the cab. The truck was still running at an idle. The door was closed, but no driver was seen from the driver's window. The front driver's windshield was busted, and there was a large hole in the middle. The trailer was loaded with flat, quarter-inch steel sheets. Of course, it's pitch black, and we couldn't really see things that well when we first got there. Our impression was that the driver smacked a tree, hit his head on the windshield, and was already getting treatment somewhere else. So my dad set up the wrecker to the hook on the trailer, and he wanted me to open the cab in order to release the brakes. When I opened the door, I was greeted with the sight of the lower half of a body. When the driver hit the tree, a single sheet of steel broke free and cut through the cab cutting the driver in half. The upper half of his body went through the windshield. I found the rest of him about 40 feet from the truck in a cornfield, and he was still grabbing the upper part of the steering wheel. It looked like he was frozen in time, still driving the truck. Needless to say, he went into a body bag with his lower half, and we worked through the night getting the truck and trailer back to town. This is one of my many experiences, having growing up in a wrecker service family. I used to work for my dad, who was partially self-employed doing regular maintenance and floor refinishing for a childcare program called Head Start. The one center was in an old school which was built not long after the turn of the century and served as a church functions building in addition to housing Head Start and another childcare. We always did floors over the summer. Anyone who's stripped and waxed floors knows that when you're putting the coating back on, it's quiet and relaxing. We were the only people in the building since it was midsummer weekend, and yet it felt off, even before you entered, like something was watching you from the second floor windows. So here we are, slowly progressing across this huge room, when we hear a thunk upstairs and then stop. Then it sounded like someone was skipping across the room and back. And then it stopped again. So we finished the layer and went upstairs. Mind you, the upstairs was a few classrooms with shelves, blocking direct movement from one end to the other, filled with supplies from the other classes. No one was up there. So we closed the doors and went downstairs to start the other room. Once again, this sound started, but this time I sprinted upstairs. The sound stopped before I reached the hall, but all the doors were open at various angles. We didn't hear the sound anymore that summer, but my dad asked the childcare advisor from the other end of the building if they heard any weird noises. She said no. But the one day they were sitting down for snacks and a few kids were staring in a corner. The aide asked them what they were looking at, and one of the kids asked, why can't the girl eat with us? The aide looked around and asked, what girl? And the kid pointed to the corner and said, the little girl with the white dress. I literally haven't set foot in the building since, and I have no desire to do so. I used to think ghosts were for scary stories, but I have trouble believing this isn't real. I'm not a trucker, but a dispatcher. We had a driver who had shall we say, an odour problem. I'm not talking like body odour like sweat. I'm talking like stale urine. Any time he'd come into the dispatch office, it was a race to have him leave again. The kind of putrid tang that would make you gag immediately and completely involuntarily, regardless of your best efforts. The driver was a rather heavy set guy, nice enough, but a little slow. We let it go until we started getting complaints from customers about the smell. 
Now this driver was a flatbed driver, meaning most of his deliveries were onto construction sites, job sites, steel and lumber mills. Therefore, 90% were outdoors, and in the company of rough and tough dudes who otherwise wouldn't give a damn what you smelled like. We get a couple of phone calls a week from a job foreman saying that they wouldn't take this guy onto their site anymore because even outdoors, the smell was so bad for the workers. We started delicately attempting to bring it up, trying to urge proper hygiene. He claimed he showered every day or at least every other day at worst, and that he just smelt like that and has had the problem for as long as he could remember. There was nothing he could do. At some point, he had to bring his truck in for maintenance. It was a company truck. He didn't own it. But we don't rotate trucks, so we had the same one for months. Something had to be checked in the gear shift, so the mechanic had to get inside the truck. Upon climbing into the cab, the mechanic promptly did a 180 and puked out the driver's side door. It was then that the big piss bucket was discovered. I'm not talking like a Gatorade bottle or something that he took a leak in once when he didn't have time to stop. I'm talking like a job site shop bucket, filled nearly to the brim with urine. The floor around it was wet, indicating that part of it had splashed out. The inside of the cab, I'm told, because I was too chicken to go anywhere near it, smelled like him times ten. It was basically pure, concentrated evil. The walls of the cab had a slight yellow slash brown dull sheen. We fired the driver, using the complaints from the customers as the excuse, and then parked the truck outside in the yard, doors and windows open for a week just to dull it. Then had a guy with a ghetto pieced hazmat suit, rubber gloves, rubber boots, mask, rain slicker, etc., had to go in there and douse the whole thing in bleach and cleaners. And yet, no matter what they did to it, they could not get rid of the smell. That truck sat outside in our yard for a full year, windows and doors standing open, rain, snow, blustery wind, it just sat wide open to the elements. One day a year later, the boss decided to close it up and see how it was. It was just as bad as the day they tried to clean it. He scrapped the truck, a week later. I don't believe in ghosts or the paranormal, but this one really baffles me to this day. It happened a few years back, and I still can't forget it. Most of my friends have had trouble with substance abuse throughout their lives. Just the crowd I hang around with, I guess. Around the time of this story, one of my closest friends was clean off heroin for the longest time they'd ever been. A few months, but still fantastic progress for him, and things were looking great. We were hanging out one day, and he gave me some great news. Since middle school, he and his mum had been fighting for a medical malpractice lawsuit that happened to him when he was younger, and they won. He got something like 10 to 15k out of the deal, so most of what we talked about that day was how he was going to buy something and really go to college. I honestly hadn't seen him that happy in years, and it was great. A day or two later, I was sleeping like normal, when all of a sudden I woke up at 1am in the morning. I felt great. In fact, I felt absolutely euphoric, like I was laying in the sun on the most beautiful summer's day in a puddle of a thousand puppies. And that was just the first second. The next second, it amplified. Within moments, however, I went from this is pretty nice to, oh, something is seriously wrong, before blacking out. All of a sudden, I was walking down the stairs to my friend's basement. It was absolutely destroyed with stuff thrown everywhere and empty bottles and syringes laying around. He was sitting there waiting for me on the couch, tears in his eyes. He just kept repeating that he was sorry, and he didn't want to hurt anyone. He said the money didn't last him long, and he's back to being his broke-ass self again. That he was sorry 
for bringing me there, and he just needed to say goodbye to someone before finally saying goodbye to me, and everything faded out in another wave of euphoria. Me being logical to a fault, and pretty straightforward, I woke up the next morning thinking, damn, what a weird dream, but not much else. I wrote it down in a dream journal I was doing at the time and completely forgot about it. I ended up going to work in class like normal. Then a few hours later, I received a call from my friend's mum. She called me to break the news that my friend had passed away that night. Overdose. It wasn't until a few months later when another friend of mine, also ex-addict, was trying to console me by telling me how he went out with no pain and how it was probably the best way to go when things started to get really weird. He started to explain to me what an overdose actually feels like, the overwhelming euphoria, and how it's impossible to explain to someone who's never experienced it, i.e. me. It was then that I realized what he was describing started to sound really familiar. I went to my phone and opened up my dream journal, and started to read the entry for a few months back to him out loud. He said, yeah, exactly. Where'd you get that story? And I told him the whole thing. Both of us were at a loss for words, and I still am. As I said, I don't believe in this stuff. And if someone told me this story, I would say they were high as hell. But it's a memory nonetheless that I will never forget. I grew up in a very small, strange, almost cultish Christian church. It was labelled non-denominational. They were pretty out there in what they believed. After the service every week, for anywhere between three to five hours, everyone stayed to receive prayer. On many occasions, there were exorcisms performed during this time. I personally witnessed people I'd known my entire life going into trance-like seizures with evil voices coming out their mouths. These voices made the hair on my neck stand on end. I knew they were really demons, because they were so opposite of anything these people would say in real life. It was pure evil. I saw these people screaming, writhing, and foaming at the mouths. I was horrified. I will never forget the screams. There's no question in my mind I was seeing demons. One time in particular, I remember this incident with a member of the church called Sam, who was a father of a few of our friends. He was a very nice, funny man, and all the kids liked him a lot. One day he received prayer, and demons began to manifest out of him. It got so intense, the kids were sent out of the room, but we all listened at the door, and this man screamed like he was being murdered. We were scared, crying, thinking he was going to die. I was eight years old. We left this church when I was around ten, and about a decade later I sort of walked away from religion in order to find what I really believed in. I'm going to share with you an incident that I've never told anyone except my therapist, because I'm afraid they'll think I'm insane. This occurred during my period of searching and questioning religion, when I was 24 and just married. My mother-in-law invited me to what she called the deliverance service that she had attended the previous week. She said that it helped her heal from many painful experiences in her past. I'd been having a rough time for many years dealing with depression and unhealed childhood trauma, so I decided to give it a try. I certainly did not believe anything would come of it, and I just wanted to make her happy, to be honest. We got there and the people who seemed like normal members of a regular run-the-mill church congregation greeted us. There were about 20 people. We listened to a sermon, nothing strange. And then everyone paired off for prayer time. I was paired with this little old lady and a very kind face and soft voice. She said she was going to pray for me and I was thinking, okay, whatever. She's really sweet and I'll just be nice and let her think she's helping me. I sat down in front of her on one of those cheap metal folding chairs that you find at an AA meeting, and she didn't try to take my hand or touch me, which I appreciated. She began by having me name people in my life who had greatly impacted me, 
people like my immediate family members. I'm shaking and feeling sick just remembering this. It's very hard to get off my chest. What happened next haunts me to this day. She started to pray for deliverance from any negative ties or curses that had been passed to me. Inadvertently, of course, through my family members, her voice, so kind and soft, was nevertheless demanding, like she wasn't going to take crap from these evil forces, and they had to do what she said. I didn't feel anything at first, and didn't expect to, so things were going exactly as I'd imagined. Then she got to my grandma, who had recently passed. As she prayed, my eyelids began to blink rapidly without my control. Okay, that was weird, I thought, but nothing too creepy. Maybe it was just a muscle or twitch. Then she prays about my father. My father suffers deep depression, which I have inherited from him. And as she prays, I began to sob uncontrollably. There was no emotion attached, and I was just doing the act of crying loudly and bitterly, but feel nothing and have no control over the tears. I was just sort of crying like you do when you're absolutely broken hearted. When my fit of sobbing was over, she said, sometimes demons come out through tears. This was pretty scary, but was worlds away from the sort of thing you'd see in The Exorcist. So she carried on. I shrugged it off. I don't remember who she prayed about next, but all I know was the next time she prayed for me, my body seized up and became rigid. I couldn't move, but I was very conscious in my mind and knew that I should be able to move but it was like something inside me was locking my muscles up. This got worse and worse and more intense until I was almost falling off the chair. My legs began to shake violently, even throwing one of my shoes off. My body was stiff as a board and the top of my butt was still sitting in the chair, but the rest of me had slid out of it, creating a triangle of space between my body and the chair. I was seconds from falling out of it and onto the hard concrete floor. My head was thrown back as horrible groans came out my mouth. Meanwhile, I was totally conscious of everything in my mind and thinking rationally. Only my body was out of control. As she prayed, repeating that demons had to leave in Jesus' name, eventually my body was freed from this strange grip and I was able to sit up again. I went home dazed and when I looked in the mirror, my face looked different. It was like... I had a light bulb on the inside of my face, where previously there had been a regular face. Now it appeared to be glowing. The glow lasted for about a day and then the next morning I also noticed a bruise on the back of my head from where the hair clip had dug into my scalp when my head was pressed back against the folding chair. This is how I know for sure that I had not been in control of my body. I had been in pain and terrified out my mind. I was not able to control any of my movements during that prayer time. I have no history of seizures whatsoever, and nothing even remotely close to that has ever happened to me before or since. Meanwhile, back to the deliverance sermon, during all of this, I could hear my mother-in-law being prayed for behind me. Suddenly, the most evil and vile voice I've ever heard came out of her mouth, cackling like a witch from a scary movie. My mother-in-law is partially deaf, and she was seeking to be healed from this. The demon that spoke out of her mouth said, La la la, I can't hear you, in this wickedly evil mocking voice. It was the same thing that a little kid does and says when they put their finger on their ear and doesn't want to hear what you're saying. There was also filthy language coming out of her mouth. Words I don't think she's ever said before or since. My mother-in-law later said that this was the demon keeping her from hearing properly. But it was not driven out completely because... She still has bad hearing. All I can say about this experience is that it's 100% true. A skeptic, non-religious person like me actually experienced, felt, and heard and saw all of this. Make of that what you will. But I know now that evil is real, and to some degree, lives inside us all. This story happened at my old house in Toronto. Three of us lived on the main floor of a house, and a stranger lived in the basement. We didn't know much about the guy in the basement, beside he was a big gamer and smoked an awful lot of weed. Almost every night we could hear him coughing up a storm, 
as if he were about to die. I could hear this quite often, I began to realise that this wasn't really directly below my room. He appeared to be coughing in a room under our garage. Sure enough, my roommate and I went into the garage and jumped up and down, and could hear the hollow room below us. Eventually this guy decided to move out, and we were able to move our friend into the basement. It would be our first time down there, and I was excited to see this weird room under the garage. Our friend took us to the laundry room which was under my room, where we discovered a creepy little red door that led to a cement filled room with trash and old furniture. It was basically a dungeon. Was this where he smoked weed every day? It was full of mould and seemed dangerous to breathe in the air. Not the exciting room we'd hoped for. Our friend didn't understand our need to see the room because he was pissed off at the state of the apartment. I was surprised, since it appeared the other guy moved out and our friend moved right in the day after, not too much to clean. But then my friend told me the guy had been calm for two weeks already and no one cleaned it. I thought about this for a moment, and immediately got a cold chill down my neck. The last two weeks this guy was gone, I could still hear the horrible coughing coming from that creepy room. My girlfriend and I had been dating for around three years, and I have never had an experience that was as close of a call as this time. We are mostly nocturnal creatures, especially when we're used to working the night shift at a factory together. To us, midnight used to be like noon, and we loved going out to the store around this time because we are usually the only two of ten people in the place, including staff. One night a year or so ago, we were doing our normal Saturday evening shop at around midnight, when I got the strangest feeling, not even five minutes into our journey. It constantly felt like we were being followed, but every time I would look there'd be no one there. I eventually wrote this off as paranoia, and started to have a good time and make an adventure out of the trip. We were finishing up on the non-grocery side of Walmart, taking the long straightaway roads towards the groceries so we can get down to business on getting food. My girlfriend was telling me about her last attempts and statistics of her shiny hunt in Pokemon Ultra when I finally noticed him. I heard a slight clicking noise and looked back casually to see a man pushing a bicycle alongside him, walking a few steps back. It was brand new like he had just pulled it off the rack as he walked past and was staring at me. I got a bad feeling. I positioned myself on the other side of my girlfriend so that I was between him and her purse, which raised red flags to her. I told her to keep walking and act natural. A few minutes go by and the man makes a mad dash around a median chip display towards us, stopped dead when he saw we didn't flinch. Now I'm not exactly a muscular guy, but I suppose my six foot four stature made him nervous about what I was capable of since I was wearing heavy winter clothing. I never broke eye contact until he turns around and walks back in the direction he was following us from and vanished. For about 30 minutes we shopped around, wondering if I was just being paranoid still, and we disregarded it as much. That is, until we were checking out. As I finished checking out the groceries and got ready to pay, I saw the same man on the bicycle with the front basket full of food and a woman's purse in his right hand, pedaling as hard as he could. An employee made an attempt to grab him but was too slow and he got away. Then we asked a nearby employee if we just saw what we think we did and told them about what happened with us and they said they weren't allowed to tell us anything and threatened to charge us with trespassing if we didn't leave immediately. To this day I have no idea if they ever caught the guy or got the purse back. We still joke about this and her family says that it's possible I could have died if I fought back but figure if he had a gun he wouldn't have hesitated like when he did when he finally caught up to us. Roughly 15 to 17 years ago, when my sister and I were little kids, my sister got one of those cheap little disposable instant film cameras that are often given as prizes at Chuck E. Cheese. She was taking tons of photos around the house and took one of our dog, Chewy, outside, sitting directly behind the glass door. When the photo was spit out, immediately we saw something that we were not expecting. 
this. Over the years I've researched possible explanations to explain the photo, but to this day nothing makes sense. It was an instant disposable film camera. None of us had ever seen that woman, and there was no other woman in the house at the time. I'm naturally a skeptical person, but I still can't place a reasonable explanation on the photo. The camera was brand new and sealed when we got there, so realistically there's no way anyone else's image could have gone projected onto our photo. For all these years we have tried to make sense of it, and whom the woman was. Her stare is directly into the camera. It's so powerful and her necklace is ornate. My mum always said that she looked like a Native American woman and points to the uneven beads on her necklace. We live in Southern California, and particularly in an area with rich Native American history associated with the land dating back hundreds of years, so it does make some sense. My mum always kept the tiny little photo and rarely told anyone about it because to her it was very special. A few years ago though, her car was broken into while hiking and her purse was stolen, which had always contained the photo, so unfortunately the original was lost. But the question remains, who or what is this woman? And is there a realistic explanation for this woman stranger to appear on our instant film camera? Any and all opinions and feedback would be greatly appreciated to unravel this mystery. I went to a Catholic school, and we had a school chaplain, who was essentially some sort of friend to the kids. It sounds really creepy when you say it like that, but the dude was goddamn amazing. He talked multiple students out of suicide helped tons of kids come to term with and overcome bullying, harassment, and sexual slash domestic abuse, as well as encouraging every single student to reach for their dreams. Anyway, he once went the extra mile for a very troubled family at my school. The two kids in question were adopted brothers and both incredibly unstable. The brothers would be your best friend one second and then suddenly fly off the handle the next, making you literally fear for your own life. Anyway, knowing their family problems, the school chaplain volunteered to become the two boys' godfathers in order to legally be able to help them and their family out financially. About a year after I finished school, the school chaplain appeared in the local newspapers. He had been arrested for imprisoning and raping the older of the two lads. For most people, that was enough to condemn him, but most of the people I went to school with found the whole thing somewhat suspicious. Whenever someone encountered one of the two boys, they would instantly launch into a step-by-step -step recount of exactly what happened, as if desperate to convince everyone they knew that they were telling the truth. The only thing wrong was that these step-by-step -step accounts were usually vastly different each time they were told, as if poorly thought out. Regardless, the chaplain imprisoned and eventually died of cancer while still inside. It was only after his death that it finally came out that the rape never happened. The chaplain had run into financial trouble himself, and so was unable to keep giving the boy's family money. As punishment, the whole family, yes, the parents were the ones who came up with the idea, invented the story of rape to teach him a lesson. The guy was a hero. He even helped my girlfriend at the time get through her parents' divorce in one piece. And yet, his lot in life wound up with him sad, forgotten, name besmirched, and alone, to die of cancer in prison. My mum is a trucker, and this is her story. She was driving through Arizona when she saw what she thought were leaves blowing across the road in the distance. This puzzled her, since there's mostly pine trees in northern Arizona. When she finally got to the leaves, she realized that they were migrating tarantulas, thousands of them. There were so many of them that her truck was sliding on their guts and she had to slow down. She stopped at the first truck stop and told her co-driver to fuel up as he was sleeping at the time because she wasn't going to step foot outside her truck after what she just saw. Her co-driver was passed since it was technically his off time, and he thought she was crazy, until he saw the tarantula guts and legs 
caking the inside well of the truck. She also outran a tornado in the Midwest. She was about to pull over and take cover until she saw another big rig that was parked on the side of the road get tossed a couple of hundred yards like a toy. She called me and told me that she thought she was going to die and she wanted her last words to be, I love you to me. She pulled off the freeway and got into a Walmart where she ran into the shelter where all the staff and customers were taking refuge. After the tornado passed, they stepped out of the basement and into daylight since the Walmart was destroyed. She has many stories like this. Trucking is 90% boredom, 10% insane stuff like this. This happened to me in the summer of 2009. I was at a six week air cadet band camp and basically it was the most messed up six weeks of my life. Second night there, we're lying in our bed in the barracks. There's eight of us to a room and we're awake and just about midnight talking about girls and texting. One guy called Alex is the only one sleeping and is lying on the bottom bunk next to the door. Suddenly he moans and is like, guys, why am I drinking? We all burst out laughing, but then he flipped on the light and he was covered in blood. So we call the sergeant to change his sheets and shirt and they flip off the light while he's cleaning himself in the bathroom. We lay there, staring up, waiting for Alex's return. When he does, he flips on the lights, then he turns them off again once he's in bed. This time we notice there's a weird glow on the ceiling. The dude on Alex's top bunk called Brad starts freaking out and jumps off his bed. Naturally, we all jump off our beds too to see what he's tripping about. On the ceiling in glow-in-the-dark letters are the words, die, Adam, and it looks like it has blood spattered around it. By the way, Adam was the name of a kid who supposedly committed suicide years ago in that very same barrack block. Bear in mind those letters were definitely not there before he returned from his nosebleed cleanup. We freaked out and yelled for the sergeants and basically didn't sleep that night. That's just the beginning. Fast forward a few weeks and a bunch of us, Alex and Brad included, are chilling in a room Enter Sergeant Williams looking very pissed off. He mentions that a friend of his recently got shot in a gang related something or other. His reaction is to sit down cross legged and start chanting in some language. One kid called Simon says, You're gonna burn yourself out. Sergeant Williams says, No, I have more than you think. Now the rest of us don't have any idea what the hell's going on, so we start laughing while he does this weird snapping them patting the ground thing. Angry, he tells us he's chanting in Gaelic and that he can manipulate energy with his mind. We're all like 17, 14 year olds, so we burst out laughing. He beckons me over and tells me to put out my hand and I oblige and he hovers his hand over mine and I'm like, what the hell is this? And then my hand turns really hot and I retract it quickly. I'm scared, so I just leave the room a few minutes later, Sergeant Williams tracks each of us down and tells us that if we tell anyone, he will, no joke, end us. I nod and keep silent. I'm easily bullied. But Alex and one of his friends go straight to the sergeants. I wasn't there, but from what Alex told me, I gathered that Alex and his friend were put into lockdown while the police came and took a struggling Sergeant Williams away. We heard rumors that he was temporarily moved to an asylum. One more weird thing happened. We were about four weeks into the camp. It was Saturday and it was windy as hell. They wouldn't let us out of our barracks because apparently there was a tornado warning and they had put us on standby and that we may be moving to the basement. So we all sat in the halls, polishing our boots and singing Amazing Grace while the power went out. It was like a movie because there was lightning and stuff and people were hysterical. Suddenly, some idiot at the window starts freaking out and a bunch of us run over to see what's outside. Now, I didn't get to see it, but people say they saw a very Sergeant Williams looking like figure standing in the middle of the field behind our barracks staring at us. Some serious horror movie kind of stuff. It was awesome and horrifying at the same time. Craziest six weeks ever.
This is a true story. My wife and I will swear to it in front of any person on the planet. We lived in a fairly new double wide mobile home that sits on a spot that has never had any house of any kind on it and is at least half a mile from anywhere any houses have ever sat. So you would not think that it's a likely location for a haunting. However, my wife and I have on this occasion seen some rather strange things here and there, the most of which I will relate to here. One night after an uneventful day, my wife and I retired for the night. We sleep in a large waterbed. Some time had passed and I was unable to sleep. My wife's breathing had become regular and reached a point where I assumed she was asleep. It must be also known that we leave a light on in the bathroom furthest from our bedroom because we normally have children in the house. However, that night, there was no one in the house except for my wife and I. But the light was on as usual, casting a glow through our open bedroom door, which weakly lit it. While lying there, unable to sleep, I became aware of a presence and suddenly, and silently, a figure moved through our bedroom door and proceeded parallel to our bed. Then, rounding the corner of our bed, took up a fixed position at the foot of our bed. I was aware that this entity was conscious of us and was intently watching us as we lay there. The entity can best be described as something that had the appearance of black smoke or a shadow. However, it was more material than either of these, but less material than a real person. The most odd thing about this was my lack of fear. Although I was actually aware of this being and the fact it was not of this earth as we perceived it, it did not seem to arouse any fear response to me. I would say it aroused a feeling that would fit somewhere between creepy, awed and curious, especially considering the fact that it was aware of me and I was aware of it. After some time, I almost convinced myself that I was imagining it, but then I became aware of the fact that my wife was no longer breathing like she was asleep, but was breathing almost silently. I then said, honey, you awake? To which she answered, yes. Then I said, do you see anything? Expecting her to reply to be, what do you mean? But much to my surprise, she said, you mean the thing standing at the foot of our bed? At this time, I did become somewhat nervous. We lay there for about 10 minutes and then it was gone. It just over a period of about 10 seconds became less solid and our perception of it became weaker until it simply wasn't there anymore. And then it was as if it had never been there at all. Nothing like this has ever happened since, and the only evidence it ever existed are mine and my wife's memories of it. Usually, I get sleep paralysis during the day, in a nap, if I'm on my back. And usually it's one of four things. An invisible entity trying to choke me and drag me around the room, up to the ceiling especially. Two, an invisible entity trying to assault me. Three, just a general falling or flying sensation. And sometimes it seems like I'm gonna go through a wall or the floor, and I've pulled an ant man and went subatomic or some stuff. The fourth kind is where I see people all around, whether they be strangers or friends or my significant other. Like it'll just be me home alone and it'll happen and I'll just hear the sound of my significant other come home, clear his throat, kick his shoes off, and sit in his unbearably squeaky desk chair, or it'll sound like strangers may be walking in and out, and that they're all around me, but I can't make out what they're actually saying. In any case, one day I'm in the bedroom napping, and sleep paralysis happens. This time it sounds like there's a bunch of people walking back and forth outside the bedroom window, but I can't make out anything of what's being said. I'm trying to move, trying to hear the voices better, trying to just snap the hell out of it, but I'm not having any luck. Then, one male voice comes in clear as a bell and just says, Poop. That broke the spell and I woke up laughing my ass off at the singular word. 10 out of 10 sleep paralysis experience would gladly do over again, just for all the other kinds.
This happened 19 years ago, when I was 19, and just moved into my first real house with roommates that I picked. We decided to head to Walmart to pick up some house things and whatnot. Six of us go. It's myself plus four female roommates and one roommate's boyfriend called Daniel. We head to Walmart in my 98 Bronco 2, Hasis, the most badass vehicle to ever vehicle. We get there and start shopping in a perfectly normal fashion. I mean, we're being loud and obnoxious young adults, but that's normal. Now, for the story's sake, I need to let you know that I am a talker. I talk to everyone. I compliment strangers, say hello if we make eye contact while walking, that sort of thing. I will not say that I do not know a stranger because I am terribly shy when I'm alone, but when in a group, I am very outgoing and friendly. And that was my mistake this evening. We're two hours in, and we pass this dude, probably our age, but no one can really tell. As I glance up, we make eye contact, so I feel obligated to say hello. And we all go about our merry way. Only, he went about our merry way. We are in this store for a solid 45 minutes, haven't even gotten halfway through, and he crosses our paths again. He walks up to me with his head down, like with his chin to his chest, sticks out his hand and says, here, and rushes away. It's his phone number. Aw oh, man, that's super sweet. I feel bad having no intention of calling him, but it was a sweet gesture, or so I thought. It had now been the better part of two hours, going down every aisle discussing as adults what we do or do not need, we thought we were so grown. Let's discuss whether these trash bags are cost efficient before buying them in a group, all huddled up like adults do. And we cross paths with him once more. He stops in the middle of the aisle and just stares at us as we pass. I'm a little weirded out and so is Daniel, the roomie's boyfriend. And he grabs my hand and starts acting like he's my boyfriend. The guy proceeds to follow us through the remainder of our journey. We get to the checkout. There are five girls, each with a full cart, Poor cashier. I know she was just done. And we see him four lanes away checking out with a soda. Daniel is getting uneasy and pissed off, so he grabs my waist and loudly shouts, Let's go, babe, or some stuff like that. And we walk out. He walks out with us. We get to my car and begin loading things, and this guy goes to his car and just sits there staring. Daniel is now standing near the back of the car with a rubber mallet just smacking it into his hand like he's a mobster thinking it would make the guy leave, but it did not. We finish loading and pile in to head out. I turn my vehicle on and the dude's vehicle starts as well. We pull out and head home normally until Daniel, who's been watching these headlights like a hawk says, don't go home, drive to the police station or a firehouse or something. That guy's been behind us since we left Walmart. All five of the 19-year-old girls he's in the car with start freaking out. The dude stays with us until we turn into a fire station and he kept going. And we sat in the parking lot for a good 20 minutes to half hour, looking to see if he'd come back. He didn't, and we head home. This event is why I haven't been back to Walmart since. I still talk to random strangers though. I can't help it. I really like people. But to the Walmart creep, let's not meet again. I grew up on an island in Alaska, and I lived on the same property since birth to high school graduation. Our house was two stories, and the downstairs had a bathroom, furnace room, storage room, entryway, and rec room. One of the walls had some plywood pieces up so that we could feed extension cords through it into our crawl space. We had a C-shaped driveway that you would enter from one side and then park in the carport and then just drive forward towards the exit. The crawl space consisted of two big water tanks because we caught our own rainwater and used this area for storage. This space was 10 by 15, but only three foot high. You had to lift a cover up to get into the water tanks and you could only enter the crawl space from the side of the house. It was a two by two door that we kept a master lock on but never actually locked it. Our dog Brewster's area was on this side of the house as well. He had a big fenced area, his own stairway and porch, which was half covered, and he had a doghouse. 
Brewster weighed about 130 pounds, was a fantastic dog who only barked when necessary. During the summer, we had black bears in our yard most nights, and Brewster would give a quick bark to get them on their way, and we knew his barks. There are four of us in our family, my parents, myself, and my older brother, who is two years older and has Down syndrome. My brother was in special education at school, and there were other kids who would come into the same room, but just once in a while throughout the day, because they had a smaller disability and were able to keep up in some general classes, but some of the kids had discipline problems or mental illnesses. My brother was loved by the kids in school, and everyone knew him. One day, a native kid that was about 15 came to our door and wanted to play with Travis. We thought it was odd because Travis has moderate downs and he didn't really like playing with other kids. He liked watching kids play. Travis liked watching movies and listening to music and my mum asked the kid what his name was and he said that he was Mark and that he knew Travis from junior high the year before because he would go into Travis's class sometimes to help him with his schoolwork. I remember him staring at me a little bit too much and he didn't seem like someone who was mentally challenged. My mum let him come in but kept a watch for life. Travis seemed like he didn't want him there and my mum told Mark that we were having dinner soon and that it was time for him to go. My mum found out that he had moved into the area where we lived but it was still a little ways away. He had been in and out of foster care most of his life. His parents were abusive addicts and I think he came over another time and my mum felt bad for him but she always felt like something was off like he was coming over because of me. My mum politely told him that Travis didn't really want having visitors over, and he seemed okay with that and never returned. My parents went to a church service on Wednesday evenings and would always be gone a few hours. I would stay home with Travis. At the time, I was 11 and he 13, and I started helping out in the church nursery when I was nine. And when I turned 11, my best friend and I took a babysitting course which included CPR and first aid. We would babysit together at age 12 and started babysitting on our own. My mum was a homemaker and was always home except for Wednesday's church service. My parents didn't drink, do drugs or smoke and I can only remember my parents going out a few times when we needed a babysitter. I would leave the downstairs doors unlocked for my parents when they were going to be gone a few hours. I was expecting them home in about a half hour and was surprised when I heard the downstairs door open and I thought I must not have heard the car pull up and Travis was up past his bedtime so I quietly tell Travis to go to his bedroom and to get into bed. I start walking through the kitchen to the top of the stairs and I call out Mum? Dad? and I hear the footsteps stop and I'm looking down the stairs and I think I could see men's work boots and jeans. These aren't my parents. The way the stairs were set up you could only see the bottom half of someone without descending the stairs. I'm scared to death and I turn to Travis, who is going down the hall and I drag him and grab him to my parents' bedroom, because it's the only room that locks, has a phone and rifles. Down kids are very stubborn so my brother just wants to go to his room but I get him to sit down on the bed. I'm trying to keep him in the room while I grab a gun. I'm trying to call my neighbour and I can hear him walking around downstairs still. My neighbour answers her phone immediately and I whispered that someone was in my house and I was scared. She told me to come out the front porch and she'd be there. I get the courage to run to the door and get outside. Thankfully, she's in the driveway and has her dog with her. She lets me know that she's going to enter the house through the downstairs and she disappears from sight but comes back quickly and tells me the door is locked and she makes her way up the stairs gets to the top when she hears the downstairs door open and the crunching of gravel as the intruder is running off. She lets go of her dog's leash and the dog chased the person into the woods. The dog came back 10 minutes later and our neighbour sat with us until my parents got home. The police were never called because I think my parents assumed it was a neighbourhood boy screwing with me and we lived in a safe place where you just had to worry about bears and an occasional wolf. A week after this incident, our dog would bark 15 minutes after we went to bed every night. We would look out the window and never see anything. We figured it was bears because it was springtime and Brewster was probably just getting used to them again. A few months, the barking still happened 
and I had my best friend stay the night and we would always lay in the downstairs so that we could be louder and stay up as late as we liked. Kate had a brother that was seven years older and we asked if he'd bring us some booze. I knew we were young, but that was the normal thing for our town. Kids started drinking, smoking and doing it in the middle of school because of boredom. I think we got 13 feet of rain that year, so we would be inside a lot. It was a little after midnight and her brother never showed up and Brewster never barked that night either. We were sitting on the stairs braiding each other's hair when we both got a feeling of someone staring at us and we looked over and a guy was staring into the window. We ran up the stairs in panic. We thought maybe it was her brother but he wouldn't have come up to the window to spy on us like that and the face seemed too dark to be his. But we had the lights on in the downstairs and there were no lights by that window outside so it's hard to tell who it was. We didn't want to wake my parents up just in case it was her brother and we waited 30 minutes and worked back down to grab her stuff and went to sleep in my bedroom for the night. The next day we spoke to her brother and it wasn't him and that night Brewster's nightly barking resumed. Two more months go by and I had gone to bed and heard Brewster bark when I looked out my window as usual and saw nothing. I had just dozed back off and woke up to Brewster barking frantically. I look up my window and see a guy running out of our driveway. I thought about walking into my parents room but we had a trail on the side of our house that kids used to get to the road behind us. The neighborhood was on the side of a mountain so all the kids used trails to go through to another road instead of using the main road. I had never seen someone come out of another part of the driveway because the trail was on the south side of the house along with the crawl space and Brewster's area. My room was the only room on the north side. I decided to go back to sleep and as I was tossing and turning 15 minutes go by when I smell smoke. I go to the hall and the smell is a lot stronger and it's starting to get hazy in Travis's room, which was directly across from mine. I begin screaming fire, and my parents are up, and Travis doesn't want to get out of bed, but thank God for the strength of adrenaline. We get outside and the flames were pouring out of the crawl space. We get Brewster out of his enclosure, and the neighbors all come out to help us. The firemen were rather quick, but the fire had destroyed the crawl space and my parents and Travis's bedrooms Thankfully, the firefighters got the fire extinguished and no one was physically hurt. This was one of the scariest nights of my life though. I'll always remember the fire chief kneeling down to speak to me after he had talked to my parents when he said, Melinda, we believe it was arson. I look at him with tears streaming down my face and I say in anger, Who is arson? And everyone started laughing so hard. And I'm thinking now how funny that was. That damn arson could have killed my family. So he explains what arson is, and I'm still friends with the old fire chief's son, and I share that story with him often, because his father passed away from cancer when we were teens. His father is the only happy memory I have from that horrific night. The island I grew up on had a city and a village out south. We lived out south, but before the village. We had firemen from out south, north, and the city. We had state troopers from the island and city cops in the city limits. My mum took my brother and I to our family friend's house and my dad dealt with the fire officials and the state troopers that showed up after. After the investigation, my family, neighbours and the firemen pieced together that a person had been living in our crawl space for four months. We knew he had set the house on fire on purpose. He used a box of matches. My mum said the first odd thing she noticed that night was the smell of sulphur. We knew who did it. It was Mark. His uncle was one of the firemen who first showed up at our house and saw him standing near our driveway watching. My mum had told him my description of what the person was wearing that I saw fleeing our house, and it was what he was wearing. Behind our house near the crawl space area, my dad found where he hung out when he wasn't in the crawl space. There were a bunch of cigarette butts, soda cans, which we also found in the crawl space, but because our crawl space wasn't locked, our insurance policy wouldn't have paid for the repairs. Because of our water tanks, the space was supposed to be locked. 
So my parents never said anything to the police and the firemen never said anything. By pursuing this, we could not have a home, a house my father had built. It took four months for a house to be repaired and it smelt like ozone years later. What bothers me the most is knowing he had seen me and my friends undress numerous times while changing in the rec room during tons of sleepovers. Where he had set up shop was right next to the plywood with the holes drilled through. He listened to all our secrets, and I never explained to my friends that he had seen us and heard us during our sleepovers because I didn't want them to feel sick to their stomachs, like I still do. I still have issues when it comes to being home alone. I can't sleep if I'm the only adult in the house, and I keep the volume on everything very low, and I'm scared to shower. I like to be able to see the front door, and I have night terrors to this day. I'm 34 now, and I've been dealing with anxiety since the fire, and panic attacks since I was 18, and recently have been diagnosed with PTSD. When the intruder was in his early 20s, he was caught for burning down a few houses and was put in jail. All my childhood toys were stored in the crawl space, along with a lot of our family's sentimental possessions. I have been dealing with a possible neurological condition for the past year, and I lose my train of thought easy and struggle to find words that are simple. Thank you all so much for listening. I was on holiday staying at my sister's old house. We were having a coffee and talking, catching up, because we hadn't seen each other in a while. She told me that her and her partner, now ex-partner, had both recently seen a dark figure staring at them both through the window on the hallway door while they were watching TV. I noticed that the house was strange. I used to get a comfortable feeling at the house, but during this visit, something was different. I don't really know quite how to explain it, it just felt off and definitely different in some way. Their flatmate's room was always freezing, regardless of how hot it was outside. I had a nightmare one night. That woke me up. Something was whispering, Albert, or something along those lines, and I felt as though I were possessed and had no control over my body. I started walking from the spare room into the hallway towards the lounge in this state. The closer I got, the weirder I felt, when suddenly I awoke in a sweat trying to figure out what had just happened, since it felt so vivid and realistic, but I knew I was dreaming, and that it didn't happen really. It was just an odd dream. So, I thought there was maybe some kind of link, with the name I heard whispered. My cousin, who stayed for a night on the couch in the lounge, also had a strange dream about the same time as me. She was sleeping on the couch and started levitating into the air above the couch and suddenly dropped. She explained, it's kind of like those dreams where you are falling and suddenly wake up before you hit the ground. Sometimes, when you walk to the toilet or kitchen in the morning, you would hear footsteps behind you or feel a tap on your back. I thought it was my mind playing tricks on me at first until I decided to start doing tests. I'd wake up, walk into the kitchen, and as soon as I'd hear extra footsteps, I'd suddenly come to a halt and stop moving just to hear the steps continuing behind me. The only times any of us recall this happening is when one of us was alone, and usually in the early morning. We had told my aunt about everything going on at the house so she was interested and wanted to come and see for herself. She was walking around the house, looking and listening out for anything strange. She went into the flatmate's room, the one that was always very cold. It was calm, and nothing was out of the ordinary. But as soon as she entered the room, a set of drawers next to the wall by the door suddenly slid in front of the doorway, as if to prevent her from entering. I don't know how heavy they were, but judging by the size, it would have probably taken a decent amount of effort to push across the floor like that. She stepped back from the doorway, and things started being thrown across the room into the walls by themselves. I saw books and lamps fly across the room, and then the door slammed shut, and we could still hear things breaking and being thrown around, but when my aunt opened the door again, everything stopped. 
I don't necessarily believe in ghosts nor the paranormal with complete certainty, and I'm still on the bandwagon. But I think most occurrences have completely rational explanations behind them. But I have seen some very odd things in my life that I have trouble wrapping my head around. This being one of them. These extremely disturbing events happened at my high school in the 1980s, some seven or eight years prior to when I went. My brother's high school principal arranged for an English teacher to murder another English teacher and her kids. The teacher was murdered. The kids were never found. The principal went to prison. He's out now. And the murdering teacher died in prison. It's unclear why it really happened, but there are rumors of a love triangle and insurance payouts. Her children were never found, but there was a rumor of them being burned in the school incinerators, which were quite large. Principal Smith was released because of misconduct by the prosecutor slash police, but he died shortly after being released. And it goes to follow that the same school produced a murderer who raped and killed a mum and her infant daughter. I knew this kid really well and was honestly not surprised when it happened. His name, Caleb Fairley. This didn't happen to me, but my father told me last week, about a few years ago when he was driving a road train here in Queensland, Australia. It was him and three other road trains, I think, and he was the second guy in line. Some guy tried to overtake all of them before the overtaking lane ended. This lane wasn't very long, about a kilometre, and they were few and far between along this road. Now this guy had run out of room by the time he had gotten to the truck at the front. And so he went off the road and rolled his car. The trucks all stopped and my father got out and ran towards the car which was now on fire. The first truck driver was much closer to the car than my father was due to these trucks being a good hundred meters long. When dad got there, the truck driver just had his hands in the air to say, Nope, I can't handle this. What he had seen was the man still conscious, flailing about in the car, burning alive. Dad didn't want to see something so horrid that he didn't look, but he was still haunted by the fact that there was a man alive one minute ago driving past him, but was now in the burning car that he saw ahead. The truck driver still has PTSD today and can't get over it and feels terrible despite the fact it was 100% definitely not his fault. Driving back from the road trip, someone tried overtaking my father again on that same stretch of road, not two kilometers away from the night before. There were police up ahead, and the guy was up to about 200 kilometers an hour just to get ahead of dad before the lane ended. So he slams on the brakes just before he can get seen by the coppers. And dad says he barely braked in time to not send him flying ahead due to road trains having a much harder time braking than a car does. They get pulled over and my dad abused the hell out of this guy because he was still upset about the night before and he sure as hell didn't want to see that again. And the guy acted like he had no idea what he did. I have never seen my dad afraid, but I could see in his eyes how scared he was when he told me this because that moment terrified him so much that he could have been the guy who had taken another man's life so quickly. I hope that people can understand that trucks, especially road trains, don't have the same capability as cars. You should know how to act around them and how they work. And for anyone wondering what a road train is, imagine an old looking, generally all round gigantuan sized semi truck hauling three, sometimes four, normal-sized trailers at the same time. Yeah, hauling that much stuff, of course it's not going to be able to stop as fast as your 1994 Honda Civic. I am a skeptic in general, and don't buy into the paranormal stuff. 
that something happened to me in college that I can't quite explain, to the point that I remind myself a few times every year that it actually happened. I was sleeping over at my girlfriend's house, and for a few nights I had been having a very similar nightmare. The fact I was having nightmares at all was odd in itself. I rarely remembered my dreams at that point in my life, but suddenly I was having them all the time. The dreams themselves were terrifying. I don't remember all the details, but I clearly remember the source of my fear. It was very tall and spindly, with thin arms and legs and the head of a dog. It kind of looked like an Egyptian Anubis. I remember that it would sort of dance towards me in my dream with its arms waving wildly above its head. Almost like it had one of those air-driven advertisements that they put in front of car lots to get your attention as you drive by. Sounds dumb when I type it out. But it was scary enough that it still fills me with a sense of dread. And we're talking 15 years later here. All of this is explainable. Until one night. I was having the dream again, and woke up right around the time I usually did. Only this time I was awoke not just with residual terror, but also with an overwhelming sense that something was very wrong and that I was in imminent danger. I looked over at my girlfriend, just in time to see her eyes snap open. We look at each other and just know to get out. We flip on the lights, and here's where I begin to double doubt myself and have to constantly remind myself that yes, it did happen, and froze. All around the room are my girlfriend's hands. There's one on the lamp, a few on the floor, one on the exercise bike, one on the desk, and when we went to sleep, they were all in a box. We stood there a moment in shock, all the while inside my head. I just get the feeling that we need to get out, but we don't say a word. We just looked at each other both white as a sheet. We turned and got the hell out of her apartment, not even pausing to putting shoes on, and we didn't sleep over there again. I never had that dream again. And to this day, I have no idea what the hell to think about it. But I don't want to forget it either. For context, my brother has always said something follows him. Jay was diagnosed with schizophrenia and low bipolar disorder. He has heavy drinking and drug habits. The worst luck you've ever seen and extremely accident prone to injury. This night is the scariest encounter with Jay's demons. The night is cold, and my friend Becky and I decide to smoke pot for the first time. We made a fire by the river. It began to sprinkle a little, but there's so many trees by the river that we really never felt anything from the natural tree canopy. It had only been about 30 minutes, and we decided to make a fire. The night so far was proving to be pretty fun. That's until... It happened. We hear a strange noise, then a loud cracking, almost like a tree falling over and snapping every branch. All three of our heads dart to the right as we see a 12-inch thick branch take on a massive weight as it's rocking from the force. I immediately felt this knot of dread in my stomach. No one spoke, just the noises from the river and crackling on the fire. The best way I can describe it is a large black void just landed on the branch. No silhouette, no brief glimpse from the light of the fire, just an absolute lack of light crashed through a thick old tree and landed on this branch. I can't tell you why, but in my head, I knew that it was looking at us and feared that if we moved, we'd be dead. 10 minutes must have flown by and it felt like hours and I try to break the silence, and my brother grabs my arm slowly and says, Shut up, quickly and quietly. Fear has gripped my mind, and I can't help but stare back at this thing staring at us. And as quickly as it came, it shot back up through the trees, breaking more branches as it left. Like being freed from its grip, my brother shot out of his chair and starts running back to the house, my friend Becky and I followed quickly. We confirmed all the details with each other and rarely spoke of it. I don't know what it was, and I don't know what it wanted. I just know it's always followed my brother, either messing with him or slamming doors, 
and it still persists to haunt him to this very day. Anyone with advice, I would greatly appreciate it. A few weeks ago, I was in Walmart with my gran. We were walking around and shopping for stuff, your normal Saturday morning errand run. While walking around, I had begun to notice an older man in his late 30s slash early 40s kind of scruffy clothing that looked like he'd been working in a few of the same aisles as my gran. I thought nothing of it since it's Walmart and it's not that big of a store. At one point, my grandma asks me if I need any new bras. For those of you who don't know, Walmart sells $3.98 bras and they're awesome. I told her, yeah, sure, and we went to the ladies underwear section of the store. My grandma went to look at bras and I went to see if they had any matching underwear when I noticed the man again. I walked down to the sock aisle and didn't see him, so I slowly made my way back to where the thongs and stuff were. I was minding my own business when I heard someone walk behind me. I figured it was my gram, so I partially turned to ask how many pairs I could get, but she wasn't behind me. I looked around and see the guy at the end of the aisle. Whatever, maybe he has a wife or girlfriend, and I went back into my little world looking for underwear. I looked for another minute or so when I felt a presence behind me. I looked to my left and saw a little bit of my grandma, who was obscured by the rack, looking at nightgowns. I decided to stare straight ahead since maybe someone taller than me was just looking at underwear that was over my head, and felt some kind of press against me. Then I heard breathing. It was heavy, pleasure breathing. Like someone was just calming down after finishing. I turned on my heels to see this guy who had been following me, with his hands down his pants, obviously fondling himself. I literally screamed nanny, and the guy sprinted away. I told Walmart security and they told me they had no authority to do anything about it. I just can't get that sound of his breathing out of my head. Many years ago, my now ex-husband and I purchased what used to be an old farmhouse. It was a unique old house that had been added onto many times over the years. We started updating it room by room and had been living there about a year before we began to work on the finished basement. I had three boys from my previous marriage who were 9, 11 and 14 that lived with us but visited their dad every weekend who lived about a mile away. The first project in the basement we planned on doing was to convert one of the good sized storage rooms into a walk-in closet for seasonal clothing, sports equipment etc. The previous owner had left several cheap metal shelving units behind in this room that we'd never moved but weren't part of the new design. The night before I was set to start on the project, the boys and I had rented videos and watched Stir of the Echoes with Kevin Bacon. From what I remember, the movie was about a dad character, Kevin Bacon, having dreams or visions about a young girl who had died and was trying to get him to find her and solve her murder. It wasn't too intense, but had a few suspenseful parts with jump scares and special effects. I recall the end being something about him digging in the basement and trying to find the dead girl, breaking through a blocked wall and discovering her behind some thick plastic sheeting or something like that. Predictable, but we all enjoyed it, especially my 11 year old who loved scary movies. The next morning, the boys all went to their dads. The new husband goes to work and I start on the storage room project. The walls in this room are covered in thin panelling, so I start moving the metal shelving out so that I can begin work, and I see that the panelling on one side of the walls behind the shelving isn't snug against the wall like the rest. It's kind of gaping a bit at the bottom. I take a closer look and see a very small slide lock, like a miniature deadbolt, cut into the panelling and a distinct cutout like door. What the hell? We have a secret room, how cool! I can't keep this discovery all to myself, so I run upstairs and call the boys at their dad's. Eric, the 11 year old, answers his phone and I tell him what I found in the basement. Both of his brothers are at their friend's houses, but he's super excited to check it out and jumps on his bike and zooms home all sweaty from pedaling so fast. This is exactly the kind of thing Eric loves. We go back into the basement. I slide the lock and pry the door open with a screwdriver. The first thing we see is a thick plastic sheeting, just like the one we'd seen in the movie the night before. Holy hell. 
We slam it shut and start laughing. He says we've got to be brave, Mum. So I go find a razor knife and slice through the plastic. Inside is a small room with a sandy dirt floor that has several old TV sets and buckets of old glass tubes and an old desk with newspapers in it. No dead body or Kevin Bacon to be found, but we sure had fun going through the desk and laughing about the secret room that we called the Stir of Echoes room from that point on. My father-in-law said that it was an old-fashioned root cellar that was used to store root vegetables like potatoes back in the day. What a strange coincidence that we had watched that movie just the night before. About two years ago, a co-worker committed suicide. Shortly after his death, I cleaned out his workstation. I boxed up everything and delegated files to others and turned off his computer. His cubicle sat empty for months, maybe almost a year. One day, I needed to see if he had a copy of an invoice or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I thought there was a small chance he may have scanned it and saved it on his desktop. I switched on his computer and was looking for the file. And just as I was about to shut it down again, I heard a scream from downstairs. A lady in our office received an instant message from the computer I was at. Now, I didn't open up the Skype or Teams app on his desktop. I just turned the computer on and looked in the documents and desktop for what I was looking for and didn't find it so shut it down. The IM she received was weird too. The message didn't have anything in it, just a blank pop-up. No one else received any messages from his computer. Lastly, whenever someone leaves our company, I usually reset all passwords, so since this app is attached to his 365 account, he would have asked me to update the password instead of just opening the app. Also, we knew he didn't leave a note before taking his life. Maybe he just wanted to reach out. She was sleeping on the couch and started levitating into the air. This almost happened to my sister. She was at the bar with her girlfriend who ended up ditching her at the bar for someone else. At this point, she's already super drunk, but because she was just ditched by her girlfriend, she decided to take a few more shots. The bartender kicks her out because she is becoming sloppy and blackout drunk. It's the dead of winter, and this is before everyone had cell phones, so she starts to walk. But it's snowing and icy. And all she has for warmth is a thin coat. She keeps falling and landing in a ditch. Eventually she just laid there and closed her eyes and started falling asleep. She told me that she was startled awake by someone yelling, Wake up! But she didn't see anyone around. Almost blackout drunk and covered in snow, she made it the two miles home. She woke up in the entryway of her house soaking wet. I don't really believe in supernatural stuff really, but she thinks someone was watching out for her that night, or suddenly slid in front of the doorway as if to prevent her from entering. I don't know how heavy they were, but judging by the size, it would have probably taken a decent amount of effort to push across the floor like that. She stepped back from the doorway, and things started being thrown across the room into the walls by themselves. I saw books and lamps fly across the room, and then the door slammed shut, and we could still hear things breaking and being thrown around, but when my aunt opened the door again, everything stopped. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts nor the paranormal, with complete certainty, and I'm still on the bandwagon, but I think most occurrences have completely rational explanations behind them. But I have seen some very odd things in my life that I have trouble wrapping my head around. This being one of them. A guy killed himself in one of the girls' bathrooms about nine years ago. A friend and I were the first to realize that the guy was dead and not just sleeping on the job or something. He apparently committed suicide by overdosing on heroin and was found with several syringes and empty tubes when they went to inspect everything. We being the 15-year-old girls that we were, 
freaked out about seeing a dead body propped up against a toilet. It was all really surreal that a man would choose to do it on school grounds inside the girls' room. I think he was identified as one of the security guards who patrolled the freshman area. My friend and I passed by the man several times before we suspected anything was up. The moment I got a closer look and noticed his hands and face were really pale and almost blue. I then let out a small scream because holy hell, a dead person in a high school girl's bathroom. I think he sat there dead for maybe an hour, maybe more, before anyone, myself included, decided to do something. I didn't want to try and wake him up just in case he was in a bad mood or he didn't want anyone to know he was in there. The five minutes we get as a break between classes was when my friend and I decided to let our teachers and other security guards know what was happening. And the way our school bathrooms are set up, the stalls located in a separate station away from where the sinks are. So nobody worries about anyone being able to see them do their business. In the whole area where the sinks are, there's a bench along the back wall facing the mirrors. Occasionally, we see one of the security guards, male or female, just sitting at the bench and get some rest during breaks, which is understandable because the bathroom my friend and I often use, and the one where we found the dead guy, is almost always empty and quiet. Everyone's pretty cool with the security guards and no one really cares. The day my friend and I walked in and noticed someone quiet in one of the stalls, we just thought it was one of our regular security guards who decided to sit in the dark for a change. Guess we were wrong. This happened in the mid-90s. I went on a road trip with my son and for some stupid reason decided to take a different route home than the one I had taken previously and was familiar with. Turned out the new route was a super desolate road I specifically chose to drive in the middle of the night so my son would be sleeping and there would be less traffic. It's probably about 3 a.m. and of course my POS car breaks down. By some luck of the draw, I'm almost right in front of an abandoned roadside market and was able to coast into the parking lot. The windows are boarded up on the market, steam is pouring from under my hood and it was essentially the start to every single dumb chick breaks down in the middle of nowhere and gets hacked to death movie you've ever seen. All of a sudden, I see headlights coming around the bend. I had been driving this road for a couple of hours and had seen maybe one or two other vehicles at the time. A truck drives past, slows down, and I see the reverse lights come on in my rear view mirror. Deliverance banjo music starts to play in my head. The truck pulls up, so our vehicles are driver window to driver window, and I see the driver is an older man, and he is just staring at me. He looks like the stereotypical serial killer you visualize, with long, scraggly gray hair, grizzled stubble, and crazy sort of eyes. He motions for me to roll down my window. I'm trying to look anywhere but directly at him, and act like I don't see him, and everything's fine and dandy. Oh no, I'm not in any distress. Please, ignore the steam coming from my car. I'm good, thanks. He backs up a little, parks and gets out of his truck, and begins walking towards my car. I'm thinking this is where my son and I end up as news stories about bodies being found in the boonies when the snow melts. And he starts yelling, Not gonna hurt you. Roll down your window. I keep looking anywhere but at him, trying to give off a strong... I don't want you to mess with me kind of vibes. In reality, I'm crapping in my pants. He gives me a disgusted look, walks to his truck and starts digging around, and comes back with tools in hand. Now I'm thinking, oh my god, he's got tools. He's gonna bust my teeth out and cut my fingers off so I can't be identified. He yells to open the hood. I'm looking everywhere but at him. He yells it again. He wants to know what's wrong. I'm so scared, but I reach down and pop the hood open. He opens it, and I crouch down so that I can see him through the couple of inches where the hood is open. He looks up, and we make eye contact, and I about die. And he keeps doing whatever he's doing down there. He goes back and forth between his truck and my car a few more times, bringing more tools, a jug of something, 
and something else that I can't make out. After about 15 minutes, he closes my hood and yells at me to start it up. The car splutters a little, turns over, and then seems fine. He yells, be careful, a lot of weirdos out here, gets in his truck, gives me one last disgusted look and drives off. My car made it home. My dad looked it over after I told him the story and deducted that the guy had changed the radiator hose. My dad pointed out many times that the chances of me being struck by lightning were probably better than my chances of some random guy in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, happened to be driving around with a radiator hose and the tools to replace it for whatever 10 plus year old POS foreign car I was driving. I lived in an apartment complex for seven years, middle to high school and experienced a lot of weird stuff with many witnesses. But the most unnerving was this. I was laying in bed just getting comfortable. I was rolled onto my side facing the wall when I felt someone sit on the bed behind me. I thought perhaps my mum had come in and I turned to look but there was no one. I could still feel the dip in my bed. The door was closed, the light was off. I was totally alone. I was freaked out so much that I rolled back over and stared at the wall, trying to get the courage to reach over and turn the lamp on. Or suddenly I feel whatever was sitting there lay down and put an arm around me. I felt the pressure of an arm on my side. I felt the dip of weight behind me. I was too scared to move at that point since I didn't want to turn around and see what was there. Eventually I fell asleep and nothing strange happened the next morning. Well, I was in a room in my house at night and I had the lights out and a candle lit on a table roughly in the middle of the room. The candlelight was causing all the normal things in the room to cast shadows. However, on one wall, there wasn't anything but a box against it. And I might also add, there was nothing between the candle and that wall but the box. So on that wall was a box up against it and the box's shadow. Well, at some point I looked up and there was a shadow of a man sitting on the box, but there was no one else in the room but me. And it wasn't my shadow. The shadow of the man was very clear. I blinked and rubbed my eyes. I even looked away several times and when I would look back, it was still there. It was motionless. It stayed for several minutes and I was pretty much frozen in shock and fear. Eventually I looked over and it was gone just the box and its shadow remaining. I'd like to add I was an extreme skeptic. I pretty much didn't trust anybody's account of the paranormal. I did not believe in ghosts nor shadow people, but since the incidents, things have changed. But for me, nothing short of seeing something for myself was gonna make me a believer, and I never expected it to happen. Now I know that for a fact these things exist, but these things, I mean like the things that I saw, I have no explanation for. I spent the last 10 years as a truck driver, so I've had many stories to share, but I'll share the strangest. Coming out of Washington State Terminal, I was asked to take one of our drivers to Southern California. Not a big deal, I've done it before, but let's meet our friend Gibson. You see, Gibson here seemed very normal and cheerful and a delightful person to keep company with or talking your ear off. However, this all changes once the sun went down. Gibson here turns to me and says, hey, can you pull over for a sec? I need a ward off the snake people. This is where my brain doesn't quite process this and I say, what? He repeats the same line. And here is where my spidey senses tell me that if Gibson doesn't ward off his snake people, I'm gonna have a bigger problem than this guy's cookies getting flipped. So I pull over and he gets out. Now, here comes the weird. He does the dance in front of my headlights and all I can say is he certainly does his snake warding dance. Now, here's my dilemma. This guy's obviously a few fries short of a happy meal when I was asked to drive his ass to Southern California. Unfortunately, I think too long about this 
and Gibson is sitting again next to me in the passenger seat as nothing has happened. I drive 1,200 miles without stopping and Gibson gets to his new truck in Southern California and I never give another person I don't know a lift, ever. About six years ago, my mum and I went to Walmart to get her meds. She gets home from work late, so we go over to Walmart at around seven. The parking lot is horribly underlit, as is the entrance to the store. As we're walking towards the entrance, a man walks towards me and pauses like he's going to start a conversation with me. He's wearing a cap, cargo shorts and sneakers. I can't really make out any details of his face, but I'm fairly sure I didn't know him. My mum and I walk in and go to the pharmacy counter, which is right in the front of the store. I can now clearly see the guy. He looks to be in his late twenties slash early thirties. He's very dirty and his eyes are very sunken in. He keeps staring at me and walking around where we are. As my mum is speaking with the pharmacist, I notice another man start walking with the first. This man is very heavy set with dark hair and glasses and is far dirtier than the other man. The pharmacist needs a few more minutes to fill in the last script, so we sit and wait. I tell my mum about the men and she tells me to stay near her. The guy is in the cap, mumbling loudly to himself and keeps pacing behind me. I ask my mum for the truck key so that I can wait outside for her. She says that being a little 17 year old girl in a dark parking lot is a bad idea, even without two people following her. She sees that I'm uncomfortable and on the verge of tears. So she gets up and goes to talk to them. I'm her only child. So of course she's very protective of me. She walks over to the men, speaks to them for about two minutes and they're far enough away that I can't hear what they're saying, but I can see how uncomfortable the men look. As my mom walks back to me, the men leave the store. I ask her what she said, and she just replied that she took care of it. I went to a high school that was built years ago, maybe two to 300 years ago to be exact. Me and my friend noticed these hatches were about six feet off the floor next to all these toilets. For context, the school was based around a quad. So there was a toilet down some stairs at each corner of the quad. Obviously, we had to check these hatches out, so we did during a drama lesson that we snuck out of. We got in there, and there was a corridor under the actual corridor, which was only about four to five feet tall, so we had to crawl through it. The corridor connected all the toilets and the vents atop of the walls that were at skirting board level in the classrooms, so we could watch lessons go on, which was cool. There were tons of pipes and electrical wires and other non-interesting stuff that you would expect, apart from in one corner of the quad. The hatch for this one was locked from the inside and all the pipes had gone back into the wall or stopped. So the wall was bare, just concrete slabs rather than bricks, which was odd. There was a small gap at the bottom of the wall that I could only just fit through. It was a struggle crawling under as we had our mobiles for torches and I'm not the smallest of people. When we got through, it felt so much colder in this opening than it did in the corridor. The space was also much more spacious as we could stand up and the lights from our torches didn't light up the opposite side of the room when we shone them through, which made it seem like our torches weren't even on. The room smelt really bad and we saw what looked like a decomposing cat, which was now just mostly bone and some fur at the next side of the wall closest to us. More freakily, there was this weird stone arch above the cat and some red writing that wasn't blood, but was pretty creepy. It was a few years ago, but I vaguely remember it saying something along the lines of, if you are found here, the school will expel you, but Lucifer will do far worse. There were a few scratches on the wall and some symbols that we thought were letters, but we couldn't make them out. We took some pictures and got the hell out of there really quickly because we were crapping ourselves at this point. It was a fairly prestigious school, so expulsion was probably the scariest thing that could happen at that point. This was about five years ago. The pics were on an old phone that I can't get anymore. I would love to see them myself just one last time.
I'm a pretty logical guy, agnostic leaning towards atheist. So I think all the supernatural stuff is total crap, sorry. There's only one thing that happened to me a few years ago though that I've never been able to explain away. Let's see what you make of it. I'm out running errands and pull into a grocery store. I have to pee, but the grocery store has a unisex bathroom near the entrance, so I figure I'll just use that. As I'm walking out of my car towards the entrance, I'm overtaken by an older gentleman in a tan overcoat. I'm a pretty fast walker, but the guy was clearly in a hurry. I'm following maybe 10 to 15 feet behind him into the store, and sure enough, he beelines it to the bathroom. He steps in quickly and shuts the door. Okay, fine, clearly this guy has more to do than I do, so I wait. A few minutes pass. Oh man, he must be taking a poo. Five minutes pass. Seriously, dude, I really have to pee at this point and I'm getting really impatient. After ten minutes, I'm getting quite concerned, so I knock on the door. There's no answer. Perhaps he didn't hear me. So I knock again, but there's still nothing. After waiting a few more minutes, I check the door handle, which he didn't lock. That's when I open the door. And the restroom is empty. I seriously watched that guy enter the bathroom and close the door. There was only one way out, and I was standing right in front of it. Short of a false memory in my brain, to this day I cannot explain what happened to the mystery bathroom man. When I was in Boy Scouts, my troop would always go to a camp called Camp Taquits for our yearly summer camp. That specific year, they had an abnormal bear activity in and around the camp. It was a pretty sizable camp, but it was still way out in the boonies. So an encounter with a chipmunk was just as common as it would be with a California black bear. Wildlife management was done by some crazy old gunnery sergeant that we called Gunny. So you can see the situations you might find yourself in. I was tenting with a friend who had just joined the troop called James. He and I were sleeping in our tent in the middle of the night, must have been around one or two in the morning, when I was abruptly awoken by something. Everything is dead silent, aside from a plasticky creaking sound. Then I see it right above my head. Something was pushing the tent in so hard that it began to cave in right above, like something was leaning on it with all of their weight, except these tents were relatively strong. I mean, I could, as a preteen, jump on them and you'd just bounce right off. So being the scared little 13-year-old I was, I began to smack whatever it was with all my might, while simultaneously clubbing James with my fist to get him to wake up. Mind you, James is an incredibly deep sleeper, so this effect does nothing. Whoever or whatever it is was leaning so hard that it was almost touching my head. When James woke up from the nightmare he was having, he let out a blood-curdling, ten-year-old girl being murdered in the woods type scream. Whatever it was, stopped leaning on the tent and vanished silently into the night. So for a few years, James, who had no recollection of the event whatsoever, and I always assumed it was a bear after the meds in my day pack. But after staffing at the camp and getting to know the lore of the grounds a little better, I think something else may have been afoot. There have been many strange happenings around the camp, both paranormal and just normally unexplained. There's the usual Bigfoot and ghost stories, but older scouts and even administrative higher-ups claim to have seen things. Claims of Wendigo, Skimwalker, hybrid things. Some dead guy called Dragthump, and a bunch of Native American myths. And the fact that there are no tears in the tent flap from the bear claws. We were the furthest away from the bear box. The fact that there was absolutely no sound from the supposed bear, as black bears make a hell of a lot of ruckus, and the fact that it was just persistently leaning on the tent instead of clawing at it like most bears tend to do, made me believe it was no yogi or smoky. It did not behave like bears do, and even if it was some older scout attempting to play a joke on us, they wouldn't have been heavy enough to lean that far into the tent, and probably would have erupted into laughter right after. Plus, my troop isn't like that. It's full of a bunch of mild-mannered city boys, perfect Eagle Scout material. Everything just seemed... off. I was deep in Texas, coming out of Laredo. 
a Mexican truck, starts coming up alongside me. You can spot them easy enough when you know what you're looking for. He gets up next to me, and no one is at the wheel. And then I notice two straps are on the wheel, and what I can only assume is the dude was attempting to drive the sleeper with a set of reins. I backed way off and let them get much further ahead of me. I didn't want to die because of this moron. I saw them, three of them, in one truck. Later, at the border check on 35, they were in cuffs. I was not surprised. Idiots could have killed lots of people. On another occasion, I was running on Kansas Highway 96, out of Great Bend early one morning. Dawn was just peeking over the horizon back to the east. I rounded the curve out of town, heading west, when I see Bambi and the gang crossing the road. Must have been at least 12 of them. I get up in the middle of the road and lay on the air horn. They stop crossing, but they all start running along both sides of the road in the direction I'm going. I get back on the throttle, and just as I come onto the group, I see two of the deer on the north side decide that at that very moment they want to join the group on the south. Reflexes kick in, and I jumped into the oncoming lane to avoid them. I saw one's face clear as day, as my fender and door went past him. He didn't hit the front corner of my trailer or my drives, luckily. However, he did hit his head on the side of my trailer. It must have been enough to daze him, as I watched him fall and get hit by my back hopper on the side. He went under my trailer tandems where he exploded. I was over gross weight and he didn't stand a chance. I pulled over about a mile up the road where it was wide enough to do so, as it was a two lane, and went to look over my trailer. I didn't see any marks on my trailer or hopper, nor anything much on the trail tandems. The only things that were left were a tuft or two of fur and bits of blood on the mud flaps. Rest in peace, Bambi. I used to get sleep paralysis a lot. One night I had a lucid dream. It started out that I was at work and I had super strength. I've had dreams like this before and usually no one cared that I had superpowers but this time everyone was admiring me like I was a real hero. I got hurt on the job and had to go see the boss. At first I was talking to the boss and things seemed normal, general questions about the injury and stuff. Then he asked me, what do you think about the powers I've given you? And his face looked off somehow, just wrong. At this point I realized I was dreaming, but I couldn't get out of it, or rather I didn't wake up. It just kept going while he started offering me more power if I wanted it. I didn't know how to explain it, but I didn't feel like this was coming from my subconscious. It felt external and sinister. Feeling like my soul was in jeopardy, I grabbed him and threw him through this door that appeared. It was a door to the void. I felt like I'd passed a test. And before I could think too much, the secretary at our work came and stood in the doorway. She started praising me for turning down temptation for power, but she just kept getting more and more seductive. Just like before I felt this was sinister, and out of nowhere I threw her at the door too. In that moment I snapped awake, breathing heavily, and actually feeling proud of some sort of accomplishment. I felt like I'd passed two tests of temptation, and again, feeling proud of it, I was about to tell my girlfriend who was laying beside me. In that moment, I suddenly became paralyzed, just like sleep paralysis, except I was awake when it hit me. My eyes were open, and I was in the same world, but outside I could hear terrible things like screaming as people were being attacked and killed. I could visualize basically our world, but everything about it was violent and terrifying. Meanwhile, while paralyzed, I could feel something horrible flying towards my window to take me away. By this point I was actually crying so hard my girlfriend woke up and started shaking me to snap out of it. As soon as I got out of it I held her crying and told her what happened. The whole experience made me feel like I had been challenged with the temptation of power, then lust, 
and those who had failed I'd forgotten about the last tool of the devil, so to speak, fear. This all happened the better part of 20 years ago now, and I remember it as clearly as ever. It's worth noting that I have never been a very religious person, and this was the first time I'd ever entertained the idea of being tempted by the devil or whatever, and was one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever been through. On a side note, a year later Constantine came out in theatres, and it made me raise an eyebrow at the concept of hell being another dimension similar to Earth. The hell in Constantine was much different than the one I saw in my paralysis, but again, it was the concept that caught my attention in a way that was perhaps more meaningful than most. This incident happened about four years ago when I was 16. It was the middle of the night and I was asleep and not alone. I had my sister sleeping in the same room. All of a sudden, I was awoken by something grabbing my thigh and I sat up immediately. All I could see is a hand grabbing me tightly and a figure covered in my blanket. I tried screaming, but I was aware my voice wasn't coming out at all. I tried waking up my sister, but couldn't even reach her. One thing I was wondering the whole time was if it was real or just a dream. So I started to notice every small detail I usually don't remember about my room. Like how I placed my pens that night on my table or how I threw my pile of clothes on a chair and I started to pray to Humamu, as I'm Hindu, and I had a bright light behind me, and I could see some shadows projecting on my wall, and then the figure, hidden in my blankets, was sucked down, and I passed out. I woke up immediately and looked around, and everything seemed just the way I remembered. Two days passed, and I had the biggest bruise on that same thigh, and as days passed, when it was starting to fade, the bruise took a shape of a hand with long fingers. I always thought it was a very creepy experience. A while back, a friend of mine moved into a new house by the docks. The first time I was walking up to the side door, I noticed a small, old-looking door on the side wall of the raised porch. I inquired and all they could tell me was that they called it the Rape Dungeon, and that they had never been in there. I think there was some creepy story to go with it involving a small child. I told the guys we needed to find out what was inside there, but soon forgot after looking around the house. The next time I went over, I again insisted that we needed to make our way into that room and find whatever goodies it had in store for us. An hour or two later, we ended up in front of the house having a smoke, and it seemed like the perfect time to bust in. We found some tools to break the old rusted lock and got to it. Ten or so minutes later, the lock was off, and we were peering into a dark, low-roofed room, not being able to see more than two feet in front of us. Someone saw a light switch and flicked it, revealing a small room that looked like it hadn't been touched in many years. A big wooden barrel slash vat lay to the left, the kind they make whiskey and such in. On the right was a small metal can with coiled copper tubing through it, a huge mixing rod of some sort and some weird looking pill boxes. As soon as I saw the coiled copper pipe, I realized what we had stumbled on, a moonshine dungeon. The whole room looked as though it had been dug out by hand, with concrete pavers, laid dodgily on the floor, and in front of us, another opening in the brick wall that led to a room with a wire bed frame on one side, and stacked the roof with large old bottles on the other. We were pretty excited at this point, to say the least. We started poking around as you do, find some old Playboy mags and other weird bits and bobs, I was expecting the barrel that was on its side, when I knocked out one of the chonks that kept it from rolling around. I went to pick it up from behind where the tile was, and I saw a plastic bag or something of the sort poking out from under the sand. So as you do when on a treasure mission, I started to pull. And this is where things get really interesting. 
I get the bag up and find that there's another bag inside, and another, and this goes on for 40 to 50 bags before we reach a completely see-through bag that has some weird black looking thing inside. At first we thought it might be heroin or something, but after peeling the plastic back, a wallet was revealed. So now, we're getting really excited. We walk outside into the light, and see a wad of hundred dollar notes, thicker than I'd seen in a while, and they add up to around 17,000. That was a day I'll never forget. We ended up splitting the money. The serial numbers showed the earliest notes were only from around 15 years ago. In any case, free money. I have severe generalized anxiety disorder and used to get panic attacks and or anxiety attacks daily at school. One time in my senior year of high school, I left the classroom and hid in the bathroom because I felt like I was going to freak out. The material was just overwhelming, and I felt like I was behind and that everyone in class knew it. So I panicked, and was having one of the worst panic attacks I have ever had. And this sensation of, I'm going to die, which to others may be common but to me was quite rare, came over me. I felt awful, and when I closed my eyes, Something happened that had never happened before. The numbers 5182 flashed into my mind, which was incredibly bizarre, and like I said, had never happened before. Now, when I stopped, I instantly calmed down and felt calm. The numbers were gone. The weirdest part about this is that not even a week later, my dad was found dead at his home. You remember those numbers when I closed my eyes? Turns out, they were his house numbers. Five, four, two, eight. I wasn't even aware of it at the time. I was a camp counselor in a remote area. Former campers and counselors had always told me that the camp was haunted, but I didn't really believe in that nonsense. Anyway, it was the last night of the session, and I had a cabin of nine to ten year olds. I woke up in the middle of the night to one of the kids sitting in my bed. I was a little groggy, but I remember him getting up and walking outside. And I was like, crap, I've got to go after him and get him back in the cabin. I remember the door opened noiselessly, and that that was the last I saw of him. As soon as this happened, I woke my co-counselor and told him that a kid left the cabin and that I was going to go after him. I opened the door and it squeaked like hell, and then I tripped over a bunch of suitcases that were at the stoop. It was the last day of the session, and we always put the kids' suitcases out there so they would get picked up early in the morning and loaded onto the bus home. I searched all around the cabin and in the surrounding area for about five minutes. I then heard my co-counselor calling me in a hoarse whisper, so I ran back to the cabin. I just counted all the kids. They're all here. I still don't know what I saw that night. Was it a ghost kid? On my bed? For the last seven years, I've been a bull hauler, and I've seen some messed up stuff having to do with cattle. But the scariest thing that's ever happened to me was on a trip to East Texas. I had left out from around Austin and went up just north of Amarillo to kick them off at a feedlot, around a 600 mile trip. I was feeling pretty good, so I decided to turn around and come on back to the cattle company instead of taking my break. I called dispatch and he gave me a sale barn to go pick up and bring back to the company. When I got back, I was pretty worn out, but they told me that a truck had broken down heading to Texacana and that he needed me to go and get the cattle. I thought, Sure, I can do this. I made it about an hour from Texacana on a little two-lane Texas back road, talking to a friend of mine on the phone and trying to stay awake. When I fell asleep, I remember hearing my friend yelling my name and waking up to find myself in the grass with a cowboy on a horse right in front of me roping a calf. He roped, dallied off, 
and turned to face me. Just as I hit him, he disappeared. It was a hallucination. It scared me so bad I was wide awake for the rest of the trip. I used to think being outlaw made me a badass. I had run 1,500 to 2,000 miles with no sleep and just call it another day at work. I realize now it was me being stupid and putting myself and innocent people in mortal peril. I'm in Australia and I was at a karaoke bar late at night with my co-workers. Someone mentioned that a plane had crashed into a building in New York, but everyone in the bar assumed it was a small plane or weren't that concerned because they were mildly drunk and having fun. But I saw it in my mind, like I was experiencing the perspective of being a passenger on a large plane heading towards a huge building. I felt the deliberate nature of the event. I lost my crap. I said to one co-worker, thousands of people are dead. This was deliberate. It'll change the world forever. And then I passed out. She took me back to her place. We were both drunk, so we both went to sleep. In the morning, my co-worker came into the room I was sleeping in, and she looked like she'd seen a ghost. You were right. Thousands of people are dead. It was a terrorist attack. How did you know? And that was the end of the friendship that I had been building between us. I freaked her out too much. I had heaps of dreams about planes exploding in a bright blue sky. Those dreams stopped after that. I've had quite a few dreams that predicted the future or gave me information about something happening in the recent past or present before others knew. I don't believe in God, but it's really hard for me to deny the supernatural. I suppose it's like other things we don't really understand. Perhaps one day science might be able to confirm and explain this sort of thing. This story is what I usually call the scariest day of my life. I was having a sleepover at one of my friend's houses. There were three of us, and for some reason we began telling scary stories earlier that day. We decided to play Charlie Charlie, which is a classic ghost game to keep the scary mood up. However, something strange began to occur. It actually worked, and we began talking with a spirit called Charlie. Now at first we didn't mind, and my friends didn't believe it, but one of my friends called Bob decided to make fun of the spirit, which is something you should never do. I then asked the spirit if it was angry, and it said yes. Directly after this, there was an earthquake. Now earthquakes where I live are so incredibly rare that there have only been about three in the past 20 years in this area of my country combined. So the fact that this earthquake happened at the exact moment could be coincidental. But mathematically, it's not likely. After this, the scary stuff began to happen. First of all, I saw a shadow creature standing behind us. Next, my friend freaked out because they saw something they described as a white, hairless creature with black eyes and a large mouth. We decided to hide in our room and lock the door. But then we heard something breathing under the bed. Then we heard scratching from under there. The house is my second friend, Nathan's. Nathan said the sound didn't sound natural, like it couldn't have been the wind or anything. We got freaked and all had to go onto the top bunk. It was very uncomfortable. But in the end, it wasn't even the end of it. In the morning, I saw things like moving shadows without people, my shadow becoming its own being and walking away. And my friend claims they saw a massive two-headed dog and a slender man-like creature. But here's the thing. We're in the middle of nowhere. We were too young to drink and smoke and didn't get high or anything. I don't know what happened that day, but both of my friends clearly remember everything that happened. And we all share the exact same wild story every time we bring it up. I worked on a project in central London where there were many Victorian terrace buildings along one edge of the site and a heritage facade along the main road, a very well-known road. The project was to demolish the building behind while retaining the facade and build a new building behind to tie into the heritage component. 
During the demolition phase, we found lots of quirky elements, but the building needs a history context first. Parts of the building used to be the royal wine cellars, until the end of King George VI's reign. After the 50s, the buildings were used for commercial retail and other uses, including a nightclub owned by some Emiratis. So, first thing we found on site was an opening in the wall that led to another basement cellar room. There were dozens of wine boxes in there. Unfortunately, none contained any wine or relics of value, but it was still cool to find. Had I then inclination at the time, I would have saved some of them and used them for something else. The second find and more interesting was that in some of the cellar rooms, which were used as VIP booths, there were wardrobes on the walls. The wardrobes were not fixed to the wall, but could easily be moved. Behind there were two beds and a basin in each subroom. These were very clearly used as a brothel or something similar when it was being used as a nightclub. Nothing of value, but the wardrobes required moving to get into them and it was a bit dodgy. My third find was by accident. My job required that I had to access to all rooms in the building and there was a door I couldn't get into, but it was clearly a warehouse type setting behind it. On one of my visits, I saw a lady coming out and requested access. She very quickly shut the door and said I couldn't enter. I insisted I needed access as it was for the contract. She finally relented, but with a cavat, absolutely no photos whatsoever. When I entered the space, there were tens of vintage new Ferraris, some on stands, some covered and others ready to go. These were valued in the millions, some two plus, and her job was to relocate them whenever the owners wanted them and to make sure they were clean and maintained. We also found World War II relics in the lead capping of the roof, heritage fountains, etc. A great building to explore, no dead bodies or anything, but I didn't get the creeps being in there. Growing up, I was never really close to my grandmother. My dad would make me and my two brothers call her during Christmas, Mother's Day and her birthday, the usual stuff. And with that being said, I never really knew much about her. When I was about 18, she passed away. My family and I drove to her town to attend her funeral, which was a 10 hour drive. We decided to stay in her apartment since there would be no one there and we would have to sort through her stuff anyway. One of the nights staying at my grandmother's apartment, I had an awful experience sleeping. I woke up in the middle of the night with a strange white figure glowing next to my bed. I felt as if the figure was pulling the air out of my lungs and I couldn't breathe. There was an extremely high-pitched screeching in my ears. It felt as if the presence was trying to take my soul. I'd never told anyone about this experience because I felt no one would believe me and that people may judge me. Fast forward about five years, I was having dinner at my house with my aunt, whom is that same grandmother's daughter. I turned on a ghost hunting TV show on television and my aunt really wasn't feeling it. She asked why people watch this type of stuff and then it gives her the creeps. I decided now might be a good time to tell her the story about the night in my grandparents' apartment. I never told my aunt the location of what happened, just that I woke up with a presence near my bed and that I felt like it was stealing my soul. She just shook her head and told me how my grandmother used to tell her the exact same story. Naturally, I just call it a dream, but after a moment of silence, my friend asked me if I'd seen it too. We put the lights on after that. On that note, I had an incident with a Ouija board later in life as a teen that kind of spooked me out too. We had two people using the board and a third one asking questions to prove it worked and it actually gave answers we shouldn't have known. Something like me asking the other two my distant relative's dog's name and them getting it right 100% despite never having come up before in conversation. It ended up acting incredibly strange and at the end we burnt it out of fear. My school was old. It was built at the time when the coup de tête was very common in my country. For those of you who don't know, that is when the army overthrows a democratic government and seizes power, sometimes violently. So violent, in fact, that some coups had armed fighting in it, in the streets or air raids. This is why when my school was built, they decided to add a bomb shelter in the basement for safety reasons. 
time went by, and thankfully the shelter was never necessary for its original purpose. So the school started to store old furniture and various other things down there, and it was sort of used like a huge basement. Try to imagine a basement the size of a tennis court. But enough background. I started school in the mid-90s, and since the first time I saw the basement gate, it gave me the creeps. It was at the very end of a long hallway, and since it was only composed of iron bars, you could see half the stairs, then the landing, and nothing more. Imagine a prison cell, but instead of a cell, there's a stairway. That's how it looked. It was creepy, but nobody thought much of it, since it was in the secluded part of the building, and it was always closed with a huge lock. One day, when I was around six or seven, I was at recess when I heard a commotion coming from the basement hallway. When I got there, there was a big crowd of kids standing and pushing in front of the gate, trying to get in. The gate was open. From time to time, one of the kids would get out of the basement, make his way through the other kids, and run away in terror. Try to picture the scene. There was something down in the basement, and everyone was pushing their way inside because they wanted to see it. But when they finally did see it, they fled in horror. I stood there for a while, watching the chaos until I spotted one of my classmates coming out the basement running. I chased after him and finally caught up to him and asked him what was going on. To this day, I don't truly believe him. He said inside the basement, moving around, trying to hide behind the old furniture and boxes, was a dwarf. He said it was smaller than a kid, had a long, dark beard, and bark-like grey skin, long ears, thin, long hair, and ragged clothes. Of course, I had to see this myself, but by the time I came back to the basement gate, it was already closed, and the teachers were trying to calm the kids down. There was a lot of commotion in the school during the next few days about the whole issue. Many parents complained about it, and the school authorities tried to play it down, saying it was just another kid trying to play a prank, whereas others weren't so sure. They said that this thing walked, and the sound couldn't have been made by another kid. There was even a girl that said it tried to grab her by the ankle and take her deeper into the basement. After that, the gate was covered by a wooden board so you couldn't see the stairs anymore. Sometimes I think about the incident, because I would really like to know what actually happened that day. Was it really a kid in a costume trying to scare the school? Was it a homeless man that wandered into the basement and was using it as a shelter? Or was it just a case of mass hysteria? Or could it be possible that something far stranger happened that day and we don't have an explanation for it? My sister worked about an hour and a half from my mum's, where she was temporarily staying. Which was bad, because she had a bad habit of falling asleep in cars. So one night that she worked really late, I made her promise to call me, and I'd stay up and talk to her until she got home. One night, late, I'm on the phone with her, and out of nowhere she starts screaming. She finally gets out some semblance of a sentence, telling me there was a girl covered in blood, crawling out of the ditch onto the road. She pulls the car back around and jumps out of the car and runs to her, the phone falling out onto the ground, and I'm still listening. I hear the girl start sobbing and telling her, Oh God, no, not you, not you. I, I need help. They're coming back. They're coming back for me. My sister at this point thinks the girl must have some mental issues because of how frantic and disconnected her thoughts are and because of what she keeps saying, that she needs help, but that she doesn't think my sister could help? In hindsight, though, perhaps the girl saw my 5 foot 9 100 pound sister with her high-pitched voice and thought that whoever it is could easily kill her too. From here, besides the screaming and broken glass, I can only tell it from her side. That's when she sees this truck pulling up and is about to wave them down when the girl goes crazy and starts crawling and pleading with my sister to run. The truck puts on its lights and two very large men jump out and start walking towards them making clicking, catcalling sounds. And that's when my sister's blood turns to ice. She reaches over, grabs the girls, there's no way in hell she's leaving her, and in a whirlwind manages to force her into the car and jumps in herself before the men reach the car and start smashing her lights. She speeds off, 
clipping one of them and is followed by the truck trying to run her off the road for about a half hour. They only pull away when she reaches a hospital. Inside, the girl was in a panic and wouldn't let my sister leave her with the doctors. She keeps saying that she was her best friend. From the doctors, my sister learned that the girl was repeatedly raped and tied up and dragged behind the truck. To add to the creepiness, once my sister got home, she looked at her name tag and remembered that she had left hers at home and borrowed an ex-employee's tag, Stephanie. And yet, despite my sister saying she didn't recall ever not fearing for her life enough to get formalities in exchange names, the girl had called her by her real name. My sister never testified, not because she refused, but because she was never approached or asked to do so. She did give the cops her clothes, and they did process her car. Turns out the police knew who it was. Once she was in protective custody, it came out the girl had dated one of them at some point. It had something to do with drugs. And then thinking she had told someone or something along those lines. Another crazy thing? My sister saw her working not too far from where it happened a few years later. I would assume that my sister would have to testify if they had caught them, but if they hadn't, then I can't explain why she felt safe living in the area we did. About a year ago, I woke up bright-eyed in the middle of the night. I was on my side facing my husband and the closet on the other side. For a clearer picture, we had taken down the closet doors when we moved in, since we hated bifold doors, and just hung a curtain that always drew aside. We have two long hanging baths for clothes all the way across the double closet, one across the top for his, and midway down across for my clothes. When I woke up, I was already staring at a spot about midway, there was this scaly black demon with red eyes perched on my hang bar while holding with one arm the top bar where his head reached between two jackets. He just sat there staring at me with his mouth open and very slowly started moving and creeping down towards the closet like he was moving towards my husband. I couldn't do anything except watch with my eyes pounding to my ear. I must have snapped out of it at some point because I blinked and it was gone. I finally could move, and got the courage to get up and move over to the closet. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary, of course. I didn't want to close the curtains, I guess, because I figured if it came back it would be better to see it moving instead of wondering if something was behind the curtain. Had to be sleep paralysis. No idea why, but it damn freaked me out for a good few nights after that. As a teenager, I lived in this old apartment building across the street from a bar. I was hanging out with friends in the basement. No one ever went down there, so we thought we would check it out. It was made up of four rooms, one of which was off the side in the front of the building, and sort of small. Inside were old liquor bottles and jars of ravioli from the 30s. At the far end of the room were a bunch of boards stacked against the wall. For some reason, we moved them and there was a hole big enough for a person to crawl into. Being curious, we got flashlights and crawled through this tunnel. It was dark and damp, and crawling with insects. We could hear cars overhead and realised we were under the damn road. It was maybe 150 feet long, and we came to the end where there was another board, but this time it seemed to be nailed on, and there's no way we could turn around, so we kicked and kicked until it was broken enough to go through. We crawled out, there were three of us, by the way, and we were in a dark room. We searched for a light switch, but there wasn't one, so we looked around with our flashlights and saw that we were in another basement. There wasn't a door, and we noticed a small wooden door on the ceiling. We got out, and seemed to what appeared to be in another basement. We went upstairs to find ourselves in the bar across the street from me. The bartender came around yelling at us, the owner as well, and questioned us, and we told her of our venture. We came to find out it was a secret tunnel used during Prohibition times. The bar was originally a speakeasy. 
Sometimes I'll have things taken from me. No matter how hard I look, I'll never be able to locate them again. Let me take you back. When I was a student, I lost a tiger's eye necklace in school. I looked all over campus, but it was gone. When I went home, I combed my room from top to bottom. Nothing. And months passed, and one day I dream about a tree spirit in the middle of a garden. It told me to put my hand inside its trunk to retrieve my necklace. And when I did, I woke up. Next thing I know, my necklace was right beside my pillow. Do you think I looked on my bed for all those months? Of course I did. It was, certainly wasn't there before I went to bed. Another time I lost my grandfather's Swiss army knife. He passed away several years ago. And when I wasn't hiking, I always kept it safe in a drawer. Then one day it just vanished. I checked every nook and corner of my room. I even checked my hiking bags in case I forgot to take it out. This morning I dreamt I found it in front of my grandparents' house. When I checked... It was on the desk. I don't get it. Is it some kind of borrowing poltergeist? I'm pretty sure I didn't misplace it because I'm usually very organized, and it's almost as if it vanishes and reappears for no apparent reason. This story happened to me when I was 11, attending a Christian summer camp. It was night time and one of the counsellors decided it would be the perfect time to play capture the flag. I was set up as the goalie. I did manage to tag out some of the other teams as they were attempting to steal our flag. After a while though, no one was showing up to steal my team's flag, and I was starting to get bored. I started pacing around the goal, keeping a close eye on it, and that's when I saw something. It didn't move like an animal, and didn't seem to have a solid form. I can tell you that it was grey, and like smoke had come to life and formed eyes, arms and legs. The thing stood taller than my camp counsellor, who was a dude standing at six foot one. Needless to say, my eleven year old brain said this thing would eat me, and I ran to my counsellor, actually bawling my eyes out. We lost the game because of this, and the counsellor did report it to the site manager the next day. Now some people have said, that it was everything from an owl to a bear to a raccoon and even a bobcat. I've actually worked with owls since then, so I know it wasn't that. I grew up around raccoons, and bears don't move like this thing was moving. Bobcats, well, it was way too tall to be one. I have, in fact, educated myself on all sorts of animals since, just because of this experience, even debunked a whole load of paranormal activity just from doing this kind of research. And yet... I've never come across anything that would debunk what I saw that night. This is my dad's story. He was a truck driver, or lorry driver as we call them here in England. He used to work down the ports of Dover where we lived. His job would be to pick up one of the lorries as it was arriving from France. He would then drive it all the way to wherever it needed to go. He came back home from work one day, really disgruntled, and refused to tell my mum and I what was going wrong. After a while, and a drink or two, he confessed to the following story. He told us that he was driving his usual load. This, for him, meant leaving the house at about 4am to pick up this delivery. He was driving out, and just as he arrived at one of his usual pickup spots, somewhere just a bit north of London, he had to wait while they emptied out the cargo. I think it was for a supermarket. He told us he'd been here many times before and that there was a little area for truck drivers to rest at. He stopped talking to the workers and made his way over to have a little bit of a sit down and use the toilet. When he was in the toilet, he heard someone walk in, but when he looked around, as it was still very early in the morning, and he wasn't expecting to see anyone, he was surprised to be met with no one. That was odd, he thought. Could it be a female lorry driver who had gone into the ladies and the echo had just carried or something? He tried to put it out of his mind, and finished going to the loo, washed his hands and walked out. He sat in the waiting area for a while, reading the morning paper. 
They always took a while, and it gave him a breather before his next load. Right as he was reading, he heard footsteps coming out of the toilet. He didn't want to look over, feeling it would be nosy, but knowing that they would have to come through this way and would either sit in the lounge area or go through the front door, he waited to see who it was who appeared. But there was no one. At this point, he started to feel the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end. And so he shouted out into the emptiness, Is anyone here? But was met with silence. So he walked into the men's and pushed open the two stall doors. He was met with nothing but grotty toilets. There was nowhere to hide here. It was completely vacant. So he shouted into the ladies. Being the gentleman he was, he didn't really want to risk going in. But when he received no reply, and considering the hour it was, he decided to venture in. He pushed open all three stall doors and was met with nothing. It was empty. The first rays of sunlight were just coming in in the morning. And he looked around, stricken. He promptly walked out of there and back to where they were unpacking his lorry. He started talking with one of the guys working as a way to distract himself, telling himself he hadn't seen anything. But the terror was written all over his face. And after a little while, one of the workers asked what was wrong. He didn't really know what to say. He just said he had a stomachache. But one of the workers caught on quick that there was a bit more that he wasn't saying and pressed on, saying he looked perfectly fine before he went into the little hut. Then, after a little bit of coaxing, he confessed that he thought he may have heard someone go in and asked if it was any of them. Then, all of them simultaneously burst out into laughter and asked if he had heard footsteps. He nodded solemnly, and they confirmed that when they use the restroom in that area while unpacking, that they sometimes do hear phantom footsteps, but find no body making them. That's about it as far as the ghost story goes. He did have to make return visits as part of his job, but you can bet your bottom dollar that he never walked into that rest area again. He always asked to use the employee loo inside, and as he knew most of the folk there quite well, they didn't hold it against him. But when he came home that day, he was definitely shaken up, and it took him a good while and a few drinks before he could even go to sleep. When I was younger, I used to get sick a lot. Strep throat and ear infections often bring about very high fevers, and they lend themselves to hallucinations. My mother was no stranger to me spinning wild fantasies while lost in these dark reveries. I once told her I ate glass and was absolutely convinced that it was true. So much my mother started to believe me. I was around 11 or 12 on vacation with my family in Hawaii. Naturally, because I'm always the party downer, I developed a terrible ear infection complete with a dangerously high fever. Hallucinations struck at about midnight when I woke up from pain in the ear. I was sleeping on a convertible couch in the front area of this little grass house and saw through the sliding glass door an elderly woman rocking in a chair on the porch. She was shrouded in a dark cloak so that I couldn't see any of her features, but I still knew it was an elderly woman. She slowly stopped rocking and turned to face me directly and then reached a skeletal hand up to lower the hood of her robes. As the moonlight revealed her features to me, the idea of an elderly visage melted into a bare bone of a skull. Her eye sockets were empty, but I still knew that she was staring at me. I'm not sure how a skull grins, but at that moment she did just that. Then she looked up, collected her scythe, and walked off the porch. I looked out the living room window that my bed was situated under to watch her stand a little ways away and watch the process of people make their way down the beach. As the party of people drew closer, I saw they were carrying a casket. A little boy was trailing behind the procession looking blue. The casket was set beneath my window by the group of people and the lid was opened to reveal the same little boy that I'd seen. He was following his own funeral. 
It was in that fever-riddled moment that I understood I was going to die someday. Thinking about what I saw that night still leaves me with a ball of fear spinning wildly in my abdomen. Seventeen years later, that memory turned me right back into a terrified little girl. A friend was at our place for a sleepover as kids, bedtime, both lying on the mattress in my room, when suddenly this transparent greenish-hued man came in from the window and just kind of hovered in the air above us for a good 10 to 20 seconds and then evaporated. We once found, in one buddy's vacation home in Maine, a secret passage. There were ten of us, and the house was like 8,000 square feet. The secret passage started under a sink and a bathroom vanity, and went all the way across the house into a closet type deal that had a wooden seat slash box thing, where you'd push on a random knot in the wood grain and it would undo the latch. If you crawled into the vanity, you could sit up with some room to spare. Enough room for two people to sit facing each other cross-legged. As you crawled closer to the other end, the wooden box end, you had to army crawl. It was very dark, and it got progressively narrower and was super weird. We jammed everyone in and hotboxed it until we literally couldn't breathe. It could have been a panic room, I suppose, but just connected the two wings of the house. His dad had actually built it, and wanted to see how long it would take for his kids to find it. I went to boarding school, so there are a number of creepy things I heard about at the school. Normally it's stuff like kids would play Ouija board at the school and would get a phone call from the leader of a local Wiccan community to stop, but sometimes it was a lot stranger. First off, the junior and senior boys' dorm is called the upper school, and in the early part of the 20th century, a student decided to take their own life in the room there. Since then, the dorm has definitely been haunted. There's actually a challenge to stay in the upper school alone for a whole night, in the room where he took his life. In any case, a number of strange things have happened. I know a number of people who've lived in that room who've said they've woken up in the middle of the night, usually at 3 a.m., completely conscious but unable to move. They've all described it as if someone were laying on top of you. Many of you might say sleep paralysis, and who knows, it might just be that. There's only one person I know of, though, who's attempted to stay in the upper school alone. She went to bed as normal until suddenly waking up at 3 a.m. to hear a door open and close, and the pitter-patter of footsteps down the hall. Thinking someone was playing a prank on her, she opened the door and looked out into the hall. Of course, no one was there, so she went back to sleep. Later, she again woke, with the distinct feeling that someone was watching her. She heard the door open and the footsteps in the hall. This time, she went out into the hall. When she got outside the room, the door slammed shut behind her, and absolutely terrified, she booked it out. When her and a faculty member went back the next day, they couldn't open the door, because all the furniture had been pushed against the door. I was a long-haul truck driver for a few years, and just spending every day out on the road is pretty crazy. You see a lot through the windshield of trucks. A lot of people naturally assume that truckers are male, and for some reason women will flash you a lot. One thing that I did see that sticks out with me are the amount of deceased you see. There was a bad accident one night in Chicago and it was late, rainy, and the interstate by Wrigley Field, and I could see the flashing lights in the opposite lane. I don't usually rub a neck, because I don't want to see other people's misfortune, but this time I did. There was a dead family lying broken on the road, and the first response were pretty much just standing around waiting for the coroner to arrive. I can still see the flashing lights in the rain, and the little dead child lying 30 feet away from its parents. I wish I'd never looked. Perhaps you wish you'd have never heard it. Another time, near Chicago, probably around Gary, I saw a possible drunk driver in a fancy car driving erratically on the interstate. I called the police and gave them the mile marker, 
so that they could try and stop it. I lost sight of the car as it sped off, but a few miles down the road it was flipped over on the other side of the free lane engulfed in flames. I don't think the driver made it out. There was no one standing beside it. One night in northern Ontario, I was climbing a hill on a single lane and I was just cresting the top when I see a minivan coming straight at me in my lane and a long line of cars that they are passing on the other. I have nowhere to go and I'm not allowed to leave my lane of traffic even if it means killing you. So I hit the brakes, even managing to lean forward and grab the trailer spike to use all the brakes knowing two things. I am about to end someone's life in this minivan and that I'm about to be covered in a thousand gallons of horse piss that I was hauling in this trailer. Luckily, the stupid minivan was able to get back in the other lane when the other vehicles started hitting their brakes to avoid the incident that was about to happen. Things like that, I remember. Nearly dying in accidents. Nearly killing people as they cut you off, not realizing how long it takes for a truck to stop. There are good days to driving, but the bad ones were the reasons I quit. It was a Tuesday afternoon, and I had just gotten home from school. I was so exhausted that I threw my bag aside and plopped into bed. As I drifted off to sleep, it didn't take long for it to become a lucid dream. In the dream, I decided to go for a walk, so it turned to the dreamscape of a mall. The mall would be like the ones that is partially outside. I always loved the holidays, so it was quite festive once I walked in. I turned a corner in the mall and noticed everyone was gone. The mall was empty. As I reached the center of the mall where the Christmas tree was, I noticed a tall figure in the overcoat standing behind the tree as if spying on me. Due to the lighting, I couldn't see his face, but it did seem strange. Right as I focused on him, people started pouring from different stores and other areas as if carrying on about their day. However, one thing was different about them. They were all giving me threatening looks, as if I was the one who didn't belong in my dream. This put me on edge and I decided to make an exit at the door that led to the street. I looked to the left and to the right, and as I am on the long street in the city, all that can be seen in both directions is street lights and kids trick-or-treating. It was at this time I figured I would pick a random group of kids and tag along with them. They took me to a haunted house. When we got there, we were faced with a large metal door that opened and closed by itself. It would count a certain number of people and let them in accordingly. I was lucky enough to be the odd number, so the kids left through the door, and then I had to wait for it to reopen alone. As it opened, I walked out, and the children were gone. Even if they were eager to go somewhere, I knew they couldn't have left me that fast. I looked left and right, and the streets were empty. I looked to the right and thought it was empty too, until I saw him the man in the overcoat, and the uneasy feeling began to set in again, as he began to slowly follow me. Growing nervous, I created an alley that led to a grocery store. It was a sudden shift compared to my normal created order opens elsewhere, but I managed it by closing the alley behind me. I began walking down the aisles when something told me to turn around. That's when I saw him again. As I looked at him, the fluorescent bulbs didn't show every detail, but they showed enough. The man's skin was a light gray as if he were dead. I could see his skin through the trench coat, hugging his ribs and sternum. I could not see his eyes for some reason, but what I did notice was a horrible, elongated grin stretched across his face like the Jack Nicholson Joker. I was so distracted by that grin that I didn't notice he had started approaching me until he was almost in the aisle. In a panic, I began morphing aisles together, leaving a big space enough only so that I could shimmy through. I felt relief. I knew he wouldn't be able to make it through the crevice. As I turned around, I noticed the aisles were being moved back into position as he casually walked towards me. I couldn't believe it. He was following me in my dream and there was nothing I could do. I was trying to calm myself down now and I thought I needed to wake myself up. 
I shut my eyes and awoke in my bed. I could tell by the sunlight from the window that I had only slept perhaps an hour or two. The sunlight caused me to squint and blink. But suddenly I was back in the dream, seeing the man was still approaching. I shut my eyes tighter this time and awoke again. That's when I noticed the closet was ajar. I blink again and I'm back. Once more I shut my eyes tighter than I've ever had before and awake. Now I'm in bed, closet wide open. The blanket was very old and had patches that were transparent, even though it was covering my head. And I watched through the material as the black man from my dream emerged from the closet, this time without his trench coat, and I could see the full extent of his torso excluding his face. I was surprised this man was not dust from the look of his exterior. He came out and just stood at the foot of my bed, standing there, and I dared not move at this point, despite the fact I was concealed under the blanket. He began to bend over. I wasn't entirely concerned because even though he was tall, I knew his face couldn't reach me. But then his torso began to stretch out towards me far enough for his mouth to be able to be right where the patch of material lay. I saw his mouth through the covers and nothing else. I had a horrible feeling come over me, telling me whatever I do to not look into his eyes. His mouth began to move slowly, as I heard multiple whispers that I could not make out. Before I could react though, he bent back into shape and returned to the closet. After I woke up, I stared at the closet for what seemed like hours. I've never been able to explain what happened to me that day, and have not been able to lucid dream since. I would like to, but I feel like I need to be prepared to deal with this entity again. In case, if I do it, he will return. Because I don't know how he leaked from my dreams into reality. As a kid growing up, I lived in a small town in western New York about an hour south of Rochester. Town name, Naples. A friend and I were exploring his basement and we found a boarded up tunnel. Looked like a boarded up window. There was a cord of wood stacked in front of it. We finally got the boards off and discovered a hole that went about 30 feet under the house towards the road's main street. We asked his parents what it was and they told us it was a link to the underground railroad that slaves used to escape to the north, actually to Buffalo and then across to the Canadian border. We did some research at the town library and from everything we could find it appeared to be true. I guess there was once a network of tunnels under the town and this house was on top of one of those pathways. We lived in a compound that was a group of homes surrounded by one big fence, and all that lived there were my family and cousins and stuff. Anyway, one day my mum asks me to deliver a pan that we borrowed from my aunt. It's about 5 or 6 p.m. and it's already dark. When I got to my aunt's house, I opened the door and shout, Hey, Tita, but no one replied. I said it about three times over when suddenly the doors and windows start to open and close violently. I try to get out the house, but it's locked, and when I finally opened it, my cousin next door says that no one's home and that she's shocked I'm able to enter the house, but when we try to open the door again, it appeared to be locked. I then later learned that the house is a bit haunted. There's apparently the spirit of a little girl on that house that's not evil, just playful, and was allegedly playing with me. I was a teenager, and at a weekend camp. We were playing a flashlight tag game, and I was running and hiding rather than seeking. I had been sneaking around a lot, and bailing into the bush if younger kids came near. It made it more fun if the leaders moved, so the kids had more of a chance. This one time, I was just about caught by a group and jumped into an area of brush. As soon as I landed, I heard someone else shift and heard their breathing. I whispered, sorry, I didn't know you were here. They didn't answer. I waited for them for almost a minute in silence, aside from hearing the breathing, while the kids went a different way. I said to them, we can probably head off now, and started to go. The other person also left rustling through the brush on the other way without saying a word. 
So while I don't know what I was hunkered down with, it was bigger than a raccoon and smaller than a fully grown bear. Maybe a baby bear or coyote. No idea, but it was definitely kind of freaky. I'm a long haul truck driver, so I'm no stranger to the States. And I've seen things that I can't explain. But this is by far the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. I was driving through Arizona, heading westbound on I-40. I'd finally hit Flagstaff and get out at a truck stop and handled my business. As I left Flagstaff, I ran by mile marker 185. It's about 10 miles from Flagstaff, Arizona. And as I passed it, there was what seemed to be a person hitchhiking. The only problem was, this guy was huge, about eight feet tall, and looked straight into the passenger window of my semi. On top of that, it seemed to be as wide as the truck from shoulder to shoulder. I passed the hitchhiker at 70 miles an hour, or so I thought. About half a mile down the road, I saw the exact same person or thing. Once again, I passed it. But once again, this kept happening every 20 miles down the road to mile marker 165. I saw it every few miles. After I passed mile marker 165, I didn't see it anymore. So I thought I was done with it, but I was dead wrong. I got down to mile marker 145 and had to take a leak. So I pulled over to the side of the road to handle my business. I was about halfway done when I heard an ear-piercing scream mix between what sounded like a deer and a human. As soon as I heard it, I started looking around, and just outside the halo of my headlights, I saw it. I was never more confused and scared in my life. I tried to figure out what it was when I heard something fly through the air. Suddenly, I heard a thump, and sitting three feet away from me was a huge rock, roughly the size of a small basketball. It had to have weighed at least 80 pounds, and it landed a mere three feet away. I wasted no time trying to hop back into the truck and get away from whatever that thing was. As I passed it, it just stared me down, and I never saw it again. Can someone, please, tell me what I saw? One night I was going to sleep, and all of a sudden I started to sweat profusely. I tried to get up and turn on the AC, but I could not move from my bed. I was confused a bit and scared and tried to shout for my sister in the next room over, but I couldn't speak either. At this point is where I saw a dark figure in the corner watching me. It felt like years until the silence broke and it muttered in a distorted voice, you're not safe. At this point, I could hear my heart pounding like it was in my ear. Next thing I knew, the figure moved across the room to the foot of my bed. It stared into my soul, and then I could move. I was soaked in sweat, and that night I did not sleep. To this day, I have never had sleep paralysis. After that, and I wonder if I am really safe. I used to work a graveyard shift, and before I would get ready for work, I would take a quick hour or two nap. On this particular day, I had a tough time falling asleep, but once I did, I was immediately transported into a dream. During this whole dream, imagine me going through the whole thing with a feeling of utter and complete dread, just a feeling of knowing that I was not supposed to be doing this or see this place at all. For context, I'm a girl who was 19 at the time, but in the dream, I was a boy of around the age of 10, and I was with four other boys. One was younger, and my brother, who was about six, and three others were my friends around my age. It was late summer, and about six at night. It was just starting to get dark out, and we were walking through this forested area, one that seemed to be right outside a new housing development. I remember hearing a train nearby, and two of the older boys who were leading the way were talking about a tunnel that they had found the day before. My little brother and I asked questions while the third boy remained quiet, while we followed the elder two. We then came to what I can only describe as a concrete slab, 
with what looked like a sewage drain in the center. But there was no smell of sewage, and the surrounding area was cleared out, trees and bushes cut down and removed. We climbed down into the tunnel and were brought into a concrete room with a large drain about three feet in diameter. In the center of the floor, and a clean metal grate covering it. It was too dark to see if there was anything in there, but I got the feeling that it had to be water. Two of the walls parallel to one another were blank, while the other two had tunnels in them, again about three feet in diameter. It was around the same height and size off the ground, and the walls were perfect angles and are no signs of aging, and the grates and floor, save for a few pine needles, were kicked in while climbing down and spotless. One of the tunnels on the wall had a grate on it, while the other was open. The two older boys climbed up and began examining something with a flashlight. It was a rock or gem of some sort. One of them told me to light the lantern we had bought, and I lit it, and handed it to the quiet friend while I helped my brother climb into the open space. Suddenly we heard a humming, like machinery starting up coming from the open tunnel. The two boys got excited and started to head down the tunnel. My little brother followed, and I tried to get them to slow down. I glanced at my friend, and he shrugged, handed me the lantern, and hopped up into the tunnel after them. I looked up out of the drain one last time with the feeling of knowing that I would never see the sky again. My knowledge was confirmed when the lid of the drain above me slammed down, next to the loud clang of heavy metal on metal when I heard the horrified screams of my friends. And then I wake up sobbing. I still, for the life of me, cannot figure out who the hell I was or where I was. I don't know any names of the people I was with or what happened to us after I woke, but I remember every other detail. Every once in a while, I will try to do some Google searches to see if I can find anything about five boys going missing in a forest and nothing ever comes up. The dream was so vivid, so real, that I can't help but feel that maybe I was somehow projecting into some little boy's mind and got to watch as he and his friends found something they shouldn't and perished because of it. It creeps me out to this day and you can't imagine just how it itches in my mind. Any thoughts and ideas would be tremendously appreciated. In my city, our big central library resides in a once huge mansion. When I was a kid, perhaps nine, I was there for a field trip when I noticed scratch marks on the wood floor swinging out of a knock from the wall. The wall itself was a bunch of built-in bookshelves and deduced there may be a secret room there. I asked the librarian giving us the tour and she revealed that there was a secret door there which she opened for us by pulling a book out of one of the shelves. It was like something you see in a movie. It made me think of Clue, which was one of my favourite movies at the time. It led to a small display room where they put a bunch of random pieces of art and sculpture. Apparently there were a bunch of secret door slash rooms in the library too, but I never returned to have a look through them, though it would have been cool to do. My dad has an antique World War II radio from his father and an old grandfather clock from him too. In high school, I was home alone by myself doing homework in the kitchen. I had headphones in, but took them out to go to the bathroom. In the next room over, I could hear a radio talking about the attack on Pearl Harbor, as if it were happening in real time. I walked in the dining room, and that radio was playing. It wasn't plugged in and hadn't been since I could ever remember, and didn't have batteries. Then a year or two later, my mother and I prayed before dinner. As soon as she finished her prayer, we both said amen. And as soon as we did, the clock started to chime as if it were midnight. His grandfather clock had not been wound up in at least 10 years at this point. The two strangest and most unexplicable things I've ever been a part of. I sat next to a great guy in one of my classes in high school, Alexander, who was some kind of inter-district transfer after the year started. We had a ton in common and got on eerily well. 
Our last conversation was a debate on who or what Mr. Beam really is. I'm in the he's an alien camp, and Alexander was convinced he was an angel. We went back and forth on the pros and cons for both. What makes an alien, what makes an angel, and what would make them both behave like that? We couldn't really dissuade each other nor convince each other either way. It was one of the most intelligent debates about a frivolous topic I've ever had. It was fun. I was smitten. I looked forward to seeing him again the next day. He absolutely disappeared. He wasn't there the next day. His seat was empty for the next few days, and I asked my teacher if they knew anything or if he was okay. They didn't know who I was talking about. They had a look at their past roll sheets to find his name and noticed that he wasn't on for the last few days sheets. They would not give me his last name because he was a recent transfer and he wasn't in the school directory. I went to the office out of concern and all of this was far too weird. Again, they looked him up, could barely find him, would not give me his last name or any information. I asked them to pass on my number and name and they had no address or phone number to be able to do that. It's like he never existed, except as a name on one or two pieces of paper. I'm sure there's a perfectly normal explanation, but it's so strange, and with the subject of our last debate in my mind, I always have this weird feeling that there was more to it. But that's impossible, right? I managed a building in Portland, and in the basement, there was a side hallway, and down this dark and old side hallway there were little rooms that had been a part of a flop house that was in there. In the back of one of these rooms boarded up, we found an entire bathroom that was functional. It was old as hell, and we had to do a little work on it, but it ended up being really useful, and found another small room behind a wall near the coal chute that had a bunch of really old barrels and a pike. Pretty cruel stuff, but definitely creepy as hell when you're doing it. Before I moved to the States, I was about 12, and I was having a sleepover with one of my friends. At the time it happened, my parents were getting us something to eat, and my brother was over at his friend's house. We were in the living room talking about close to being dark. When we felt like we were floating, but we weren't, but it felt like we were. Then all of a sudden we heard figures brushing on the window blinds. The windows, where it happened, were across from us and we actually saw the blinds move a little bit. We went into my room and waited for my parents, but it didn't stop. That night my friend woke up all of a sudden and she said she felt like someone was staring at her. She said that she saw this tall, dark figure by my door, which was closed, but it was now open. She also saw a smaller, dark figure standing by me that was staring at my TV. When she told me this next morning, I didn't want to believe it and told her it could have just been a dream, but she gave me a look which was pure fear. And that's rare of her, since she doesn't get scared often. I have to admit that it put me on edge and that I was afraid of being in my own room at night. But when nothing else happened, I just brushed it off. I still wonder if she really saw something, or if it was just, you know, sleep paralysis. To give some context, I'm a 16-year-old male, and go to Ephraim, Utah every summer to do drum corps, and it usually lasts all summer. If you're not familiar with drum corps, it's just basically professional marching band. We stayed on a college campus and had free days every Sunday to get to know the people and just relax before we had to go rehearse the next week. This took place last summer. This particular Sunday night, my section wanted to go stargazing since there's really nothing else to do in middle of nowhere, Utah. People recommended we go to the softball field that was a little walk away from where we were staying. We all agreed to go there that night and planned on being there around 9.30 p.m. However, me and someone else from my room volunteered to go and get snacks since we were planning on being there for a few hours. We started walking to the nearest gas station to get some chips and soda for the rest of the group. When about halfway there, we noticed a strange white truck 
with its lights on parked right next to the sidewalk. It was too dark to see the driver, but we thought nothing of it, even if it was a bit unusual at this hour. We got the chips and sodas and began to head to the softball field. It was quite a walk from the gas station, so we were prepared to be walking for at least 15 minutes. When we were not even halfway there, we saw the same truck again. Only this time it was parked on the opposite side of the street, with its lights still on. It was about then, when we started to get a little suspicious. It appeared to be following us, so we began to pick up the pace. We walked for a while and turned around to look to see if it was still following us, but it was nowhere in sight. Then, we started laughing to ourselves for being so worried when it was probably nothing. But, when we were about halfway there, just as we were passing a bell tower right next to a parking lot, it was then we saw the headlights again, but this time he was driving pretty fast towards the sidewalk. Me and my friend didn't really know what to do, so we kind of just stared at it until it actually drove onto the sidewalk and nearly hit the bell tower. At this point we started sprinting, but the truck wasn't far behind. We took a shortcut to another side of the sidewalk, one we were sure the truck couldn't get to. We ran the rest of the way back to the softball field without even looking back. When we got there, we told the other people in our section, and they told the staff the next morning, but nothing was really done about it, since the only proof of the truck on the sidewalk were the tire marks. I still don't know what he wanted from us, or if I was just overreacting. But either way, it still kind of spooked me. I didn't see that white truck ever again, and I hope I never have to. The following story takes place in Madison, Wisconsin. I met a college girl that was living in a defunct frat house. They had lost their charter for reasons I didn't know at first. We fell for each other and I moved in with her. It was a great apartment complex with pool tables and giant showers. One night, when we were drunk, she took me to a room that was empty. It had two bunk beds, and above one bed was a secret door slash hatch. It led to an upstairs room, where most of the hazing took place. The story goes that one night during a party, in the dead of winter, a girl was gang raped by some of the frat boys, and they just left her up there in the cold, and she ended up dying from freezing to death. One of the frat boys was so distraught by the incident that he went up there one day and painted her picture on the wall then hung himself. While we were up there, I could swear that the eyes on the picture would follow you around the room, and some people swore that they would hear crying coming from upstairs. As you can imagine, I never ventured up there again. I work for a place that sometimes asks me to fly down to Laredo, Texas for some work assignments. I love to travel, so I always agree to go. The company always books me a room at La Posada Hotel, a very old and famous hotel. I've stayed here countless times and I've never had any issue or problems, and for the most part my stays at this hotel are always uneventful. However, one night I experienced something that I will never forget, and I sometimes think about every now and then. It was after a long day at work. I got back to my hotel room and quickly fell asleep. Nothing strange, but in the middle of the night I started to have a very disturbing dream. In this dream I was standing in a room, and someone's arms were wrapped around my chest area. I didn't know whose arms were wrapped around me at first, nor did I really care. But what got my attention quickly was that this individual was starting to essentially dry hump me from behind. This is one of the reasons I've never told anyone this. When the individual started to essentially assault me from behind, I immediately turned around to see who was there and yell at them to stop. To my dismay, the person I saw in my dream was my younger brother, I'm a guy by the way, and was obviously shocked and sickened to see this, so I immediately woke up. When I did, I would find myself lying on my stomach in bed with my face looking towards the nightstand. The first thing I saw was the alarm clock, 3.08am. 
I then noticed that I was in a state of sleep paralysis. I couldn't move my body at all, and I could move my eyes. The best way to describe this state of sleep paralysis was that it felt like there was a heavy blanket of gravity keeping me down and motionless. All I could see were the bright red numbers of the alarm clock as the room was pitch dark. Then I realized something chilling. The humping sensation I had originally felt in my dream and what was the cause of me to wake up did not stop. It was an aggressive feeling and I just felt my backside being pushed down. I don't know why, but to be honest, I wasn't as scared as much as I was confused. It was like my mind was still trying to process everything going on. I had just woken up from a dream where my younger brother was assaulting me, and after waking up I found myself in sleep paralysis with the humping sensation persisting. All I remember doing was closing my eyes, opening them again, and hoping it was still possible I was dreaming. But it wouldn't stop. It felt like something was on top of me, preventing me from moving and that this thing was assaulting me as well. I remember that I then put all of my focus on my hand. All I wanted to do was move it. I felt that if I could move my hand, I would slap out of it. While opening and closing my eyes, I would focus on my hand and do everything possible to move it. And after what felt like an eternity, I was finally able to gain control and move. I opened my eyes and saw that only about a minute had passed on the alarm clock. I sat up on the bed and turned on the lamp on the nightstand. That is when the fear of what had just happened to me hit me. I thought to myself, what the hell was that? I don't remember going back to sleep that night. I stayed in that same room for the rest of the trip and have since made multiple trips to the same hotel when nothing eventful has happened since. I didn't tell anyone what happened due to the fact I barely believed myself and it was a bit embarrassing to be honest. I'm someone who tries to look for the logical explanation of things. The logical side of me tells me that it was just a big dream all in my head. However, there is something else that tells me it wasn't. I know what I felt. It felt like something was assaulting me that night. I don't necessarily believe in spirits or entities, but it's an experience like this that causes me to pause and just think a little. I hope you understand why the story is both embarrassing and scary. If I can go out on a limb here and entertain the idea that spirits and entities are real, then could it be that I was essentially assaulted by one of them? What gets me though was that it first started in a dream. I don't understand how it could have been incorporated into it. I feel like that is what happened to me, except it wasn't a sound but a feeling. Could it truly be that I was assaulted by something in the middle of the night and that it manifested in my dream? I know you won't have the answers, but I would love to hear your listeners' thoughts on this bizarre event. My former comprehensive school has seen its fair share of paranormal activity. Caretakers, teachers and students can tell you a ghost story about it, and you know for certain they're not lying. Enter my English teacher. He was my teacher for the first three months of Year 7 before he went to Romania. He had a really long name, we just called him Ryan. He was a funny guy, and before he left in December of 2015, he shared with us a really creepy story. Having been built on a graveyard, the school's caretakers have certainly seen some rather supernatural occurrences. Once the night has the area blanketed in darkness, and it definitely takes control here. On this occasion, the caretakers had to go into the basement, I can't remember exactly what for, when they came across a horrific sight. All that I do know is that there was a photo involving some mangled-like feet. My teacher was going to jump scare the class one day by doing a raw sound effect while showing the picture, and since it was only the good students in the class, I was the only person who got the jump scare warning. I'm not sure if he knew I was into Five Nights at Freddy's at the time, as well as creepypastas and stuff. But anyway, so chaos ensued after the jump scare. And to quote Cillian Murphy's Scarecrow, they scream and they cry. Now, I need to mention that my old school opened in 1966 during the Cold War era. The graveyard nearby dates back to the mid 19th century, around 1861. So there is an 105 year gap. According to my science teacher in year eight, given how poor the town where the comprehensive school was back 
then and now. The majority of the graves were made of sandstone, so you can imagine how many graves have been built over, and perhaps the restless souls those graves belong to. And then there's the story that Courtney shared with me. One of the school's bathrooms, the actual clean one near the assembly hall, is allegedly the place with the highest rates of paranormal activity in the school. I'd never had any issues in there. Perhaps if they were true, spirits took pity on me, as all the other toilets had been vandalized by the lowest of the low, thus leaving me alone to do the necessary business and wash my hands. But I was never in there for more than five minutes, so I guess that's another reason why perhaps I never experienced anything in there. But Courtney's story goes that she and a few other girls were getting changed in the bathroom for drama. I don't recall all the details, but what I do recall is that they were the only ones in the bathroom when something happened to make their costumes, or at least this girl's, called Karina, mysteriously go into the toilet bowl. Suffice to say, they were spooked upon seeing their costume in there. Courtney believes it was a ghost. I personally, as I wasn't there, don't know what to make of it. Perhaps someone managed to pull a prank for giggles. But this wasn't the only time that a ghost was allegedly spotted. She apparently saw one near the toilets that was once the maths block turned English writing block. Like I said earlier, this school has history, being old and with the graveyard beneath it. So who knows if there are spectres roaming around still. I moved into a house with my friend. It was an old Victorian house complete with a basement. We went down and put some furniture there and checked it out. Two carpeted rooms with old junk in it and then some bricks on the floor from the wall. We look at the wall and there's a hole in there, just big enough for me to fit through at a squeeze. A dirt sloped down into a huge high ceilinged room complete with a shelf and a sleeping bag and a duvet on. The room had been soundproofed, had electricity and water in it, and a huge closed off fireplace, floor to ceiling. The only way in and out of the room was the hole I crawled through. Didn't freak me out too much. I figured I was underneath next door's house, but the duvet bothered me. I lived there for years with no problems. I wonder if someone had been living there. When I was 12, I was sitting outside under a tree. The Arizona heat must have put me to sleep because during this sleep I had the most vivid dream. I knew it was only a dream. It had to be because I remembered waking up utterly petrified. It wouldn't be until four years later that this dream I had would become a reality. Throughout those four years, my grandma, who I loved dearly and who had raised me, would be in and out of the hospital due to her diabetes and dialysis. Each time, it was the same hospital. God knows I hated that hospital. I would always know when we were there as soon as I could see that big oversized hammer and that ugly mouse sculpture that we were there. On this day though, I was already in her hospital room and sitting in a chair next to her. Then all of a sudden, across from my grandma's bed, I saw this young girl she was laying in a bed staring right at me. Only her face looked disfigured and she was laughing wickedly. I kept staring at her, hearing this scary ass laugh. Then I see her mum is there too, standing right beside her. And now she's laughing at me too, both of them laughing hysterically. I get up from my chair and start screaming, she's a witch and pointing. My finger at them both, I keep on yelling. Grandma doesn't move. It's like she couldn't hear, or maybe she was asleep, I don't know. I'm so scared alone and don't know what's happening. My mum comes running in after hearing me screaming. She tries to grab me. She tries to put me in a bear hug and whispers for me to be quiet, but I'm freaking out. Then the room starts spinning and I'm hyperventilating. At that moment, a nurse walks in. She sees the hysterics I'm in and her and my mum bring in a wheelchair. They put me in the wheelchair and as I'm being rolled away, I'm still looking at the mum and daughter and shaking from fear. I couldn't even tell you if they were laughing or crying at this point. And just remembering it makes my heart beat like crazy. Now, my mum's pushing me on the wheelchair inside the elevator. 
when I hear a ding and the doors open. I get this quick sense that I've been here before, trying to focus and being pushed down a long hallway, then into a little room, and I suddenly start to remember my dream. I'm laying on top of the bed, barely breathing in a brown paper bag. My mum's sitting in the chair beside me crying, and that's when the same nurse is at the foot of my bed scornfully saying, if she doesn't pace her breathing, she's going to die. She then turns around, walks out the door, slamming it right behind her, and I quickly snap out of whatever was a hold of me. When I look towards my mum, I grab her hand and say, don't worry, mama, I'm gonna be okay. I take a deep breath and try to relax and start to breathe normally. Now this could have been where it ended, only in my dream. Four years later though, it did end here, and I died. And that crazy nurse wasn't there either. She was only in my dream. My grandma, who was a Catholic, prayed and believed in saints, and had lots of colourful rosaries that were placed in her sandal statues. I would often wear these rosaries with a cute tank top, and dicky slacks, especially when I would go out. And I was 18 when grandma died. When I dream about her, they feel so real, and I wake up crying because I truly can't tell if she's passed or if I'm gonna see her later. But I know she's watching over me. I was in line at the grocery store. I had mine and hers favorite pink rosary on when I notice an older woman looking at me. She's dressed in black has dark wavy hair and she's wearing dark sunglasses. So I stare back, but from the corner of my eye when suddenly the rosaries I was wearing burst on the ground into a million pieces. I mean, every bead was on the ground. The lady and I made eye contact and in a hurry she walked away. As I was trying to pick up the beads, I saw her walk then disappear into the crowd. Embarrassed, I quickly scooped up what I could find and tried to look up for this lady. Why? because this lady looked exactly like the girl's mum who was in the hospital where my grandma died and who I could call the witch in my dream. I was in the mall, Crossgates. It was a pretty large place and I was 13 at the time, being 30 now, so it was a while ago. My mum was cashing out in Lord and Taylor and me being such a cool person wanted to hang in the car. My mum, after some coaxing, begrudgingly gave me the key to sit in the car and listen to music. There were only a couple of people ahead of her in line. It was early evening, and the sunlight was still creeping between the clouds, and the sky was warm. It was summer. I walked to the car, but I felt off. I could hear a car behind me, but it was a parking lot, so that was useful. When I see this big truck, they pulled up in front of me. The back was open, which I thought was odd. It was a huge U-Haul, and it was empty. A man was in the back of the U-Haul. He asked me to show them, the three men, where the Hooters was. Now, anyone familiar with this mall at the time knows perfectly well you can see Hooters from the lot I'm sitting at. Their bright orange sign says it all. I pointed in the direction, mentioning it that you could see it from here. He asked me to get in the truck, a big, empty hole in the back, so that I could show them where it was. I was kind of stuck. You see, there were three of them. Why the hell would I get in the back of a box truck? You couldn't even see the driver. I was speechless. All my fears rushed back to me from my childhood. Out of nowhere, I could hear keys being jingled from behind me. Some man, an older man, probably in his fifties, came running up to me, pretended he was my father, and told them to get off and that I was his daughter. They drove away pretty quickly, not really listening to what he said. I still wonder what would have happened if he hadn't have helped me out. I am what is considered to be a very ordinary man in my early 30s. I have a stable job. I am in a happy and solid relationship. And I enjoy traveling, eating out, gaming, hiking and culture. But my entire life I have experienced something which I have called life bleeding. I have really struggled to find anything similar online. 
so decided to put the sensation out there to open the world to see if anyone else has ever experienced anything like this. It's a very broad yet subtle sense of memory and emotion. Every now and then, it could be minutes apart, weeks, months, or maybe even years, I get the sensation out of nowhere that I'm living another life. This could be happening perhaps in a parallel to mine or in the past, but I've never had the sense of anything happening in the future. The feeling itself is super hazy. I'm fully aware and in control of everything I'm doing in the present by myself, but my mind and memories for a brief moment open up. The most similar sensation I can describe it is like deja vu, but I'm experiencing something from a different place's perspective, and from a different being, that's either happening now or has happened. The events themselves are mostly mundane, it could be someone driving somewhere, eating a meal or having a conversation, but I've had occurrences where I experienced traumas such as bereavements or physical harm. I want to clarify, this isn't just me thinking and imagining these things. It always feels so distant in my mind, and it's a struggle to bring them into closer view. It's just something I've had with me for as long as I can remember, where for a second or two, my life is bleeding into someone else's, and vice versa. I'd love to know if anyone else has ever experienced anything as strange as this. Going through the education system in England is a box of chocolates in terms of what will happen. You never know truly what you will get. Enter yours truly. I'm a female, white, with brown curly hair and blue eyes, standing at about 5 foot 6 and weighing about 120 pounds or 54 kilos. Your average girl, who did try to be a good person in school but was surrounded by low lives. By all means, I was unattractive. At least back then I was. No one wants a nerdy girl who barely has the right physical qualities society wants. Not that I could care given the Discrimination Act against people with mental disabilities as I have autism, though no one will notice as I am perfectly normal in public. At the vomit pile I will call my comprehensive school, where do I begin? Their motto? High expectations. Yet they failed to meet my expectations of them. It was horrifying, as you're about to find out. Aside from the overbearing, unreasonable rules, low-quality uniform, over-vandalized toilets, as well as soulless interior, barely anything happened at this putrid toilet of a school. Occasionally a fight would break out during break, but those lasted a millisecond before the fight police, aka staff on duty, diffused any and all situations. We did have a few good teachers, like my physics teacher, who I will talk about later, as well as some downright horrible ones. Like my former maths teacher, who I hope is dead, but sometimes the nicest of all aren't as pleasant as they portray themselves to be. And to Christopher. At a glance, he seemed like a relatively pleasant guy. Six foot four, average build, who wore a dark red jumper and was a brilliant teacher. At least, that's what we saw. He taught two subjects, geography and philosophy and ethics. I was one of his students, for the latter, in year nine. The topic was introduced to my school in 2017, and went over matters including Dante, the existence of aliens, various religions, if the afterlife exists, and the paranormal. What I forgot to mention earlier is that my school was built on a graveyard. This graveyard is where the smokers would convene together to smoke their lungs away. Some had the balls to do it on school grounds, but were often caught by teachers. Since the school was built on this graveyard, it's widely believed to be haunted, and a good friend of mine, Courtney, had actually seen some ghosts. I hadn't seen any, though, and I do believe in them. Anyway. In year 11, 2019, I was 16. We had a day called Careers Day, in which we went over our potential future careers, or the younger year groups did a sponsored walk, I was two months into grieving my first rabbit that had passed away in August 2019, and it didn't help that I had to go to school. So a day away from the annoying younger year group was most appreciated. Christopher was meant to be my tutor for the day, but he didn't show up, and instead, this lady tutored us. Unbeknownst to us, Christopher had been arrested. At the time, his absence didn't seem anything out of the ordinary, 
and we dismissed it as nothing more than a minor illness, but how wrong we were. Cut to three months later. Friday, 17th of January, 2020. Sitting down by the fences in the yard, myself and some other observant students noticed teachers leaving the assembly hall, some looking rather distraught. Something was off. I knew it. Something had happened, and it would be a matter of time before the students learned what it was. I went to sit outside my physics classroom, as that was in a quieter area of the science block, and had my last lesson for the day, which was probably the best part of school. Sitting down, I began to wonder, what was going on with the teachers? Had another teacher died? Then I remembered Christopher had been absent for three months. Must have been about him. Rumours spread faster than Sonic the Hedgehog amongst the school. It didn't take much detective work for our students to figure out the assembly was about him. Having lost my rabbit five months prior, and a teacher having taken her own life before this, I began to stress out, panicking, as I personally thought he was deceased. Someone in my class has suspected that Christopher had depression while others figured he quit. There were other ideas, plus the idea he could be dead. None of us suspected the truth. While the lesson continued, my autism got the better of me, with the anxiety to know what was going on. The head teacher stonewalled us by disallowing teachers from telling us, and I was unable to prepare myself for what was to be told in the assembly, and unable to plan out an appropriate response. Later on, our teacher left the classroom while the majority of people chatted. I got on quietly with the work when out of the blue he returned, told everyone to get down before making us leave and walk to the hall. I asked the librarian if this was a repeat of what happened with the previous teacher, and they just gave a straight no. This didn't help. My anxiety was really taking a toll. As we entered the hall, our head teacher Helen began to tell us what was going on. She disclosed that in his private life, Christopher had committed sexual assaults and appeared in court that day, and was remanded in custody and back in jail until further notice. I thought Helen said that he had committed assaults toward people, including children, but she actually said committed assaults involving children. Both crimes are absolutely disgusting. Upon hearing the news, my face was that of a gorgon's, emotions concealed and stoic. I don't know how I could stay stoic, while Helen was describing what had happened. We had been fooled and betrayed. A person who had a duty to look after and protect and educate children had been exploiting that privilege. As the assembly drew to a close, our head teacher told us to not speak with news personnel about the matter and to ignore them. That was immediately quite sketchy. People should be able to speak up especially if they've been victims, because who knows, maybe Christopher did exploit someone in our school specifically. Leaving the hall, I saw two of my friends both crying. I gave them a big hug. I called my mum and told her what happened and took note of how others around me discussed the matter. Most were talking with friends, ordinary stuff. Some were joking around, slanging about, and I heard one boy shouting, sirs and nonce, at least twice. I wished that they would end their twisted jokes that the lowlife scum made. That wasn't the case. They continued on with their cheap, twisted jokes. A few days later, during chemistry, one of my friends showed me a news article that Christopher had confessed to eight assaults, including two rapes, and was sentenced to ten years behind bars on February 3rd. Now for the creepy part. After Christopher had been sentenced, since school had not updated us after we went to court, I looked at the news article regarding what he'd done. According to the news, Christopher had raped a young boy aged 13 to 14, so around year 9, not much younger than me. Using messaging apps like WhatsApp and Kick, he had groomed the boy while messaging another paedophile from a local area near him. Then the boy was raped to the point of developing a phobia of being home alone in case he was tracked down and violated trapped like a hunted animal. The news mentioned at least 44 pictures and 47 indecent videos of the child, making a total of 91 on his computer. Christopher had no emotion on his face throughout the trial. He blamed the heavy workload for what he did, 
and I think it was rather selfish of him to say that. I was one of his best students alongside some others who were decent and produced outstanding work. I was the nicest one, but he won't remember because he was selfish enough to blame his students and colleagues for what he did. Not to mention that his class had officially been screwed over because having substitutes the rest of the time really does deteriorate your education. But when you think about it, had Christopher not been arrested, what would he have done? Would he have targeted other children? Could he have planned to harm those at school, turning them into his slaves at his mercy? It's horrifying to think about, especially when it hit it so well. I no longer attend that school. It was never pleasant there at all. I ended up finding a secret passage. The landing on the staircase going upstairs was hinged. If you opened it up, you could drop into the area below the staircase. From there you could open the door in the wall, which leads down to the basement. In theory, you could act as if you were going upstairs from the main floor and go through the above to get into the basement and escape the house from the basement door. This house is in upstate New York and dated back at least to 1895. Possibly we thought it was some underground railroad stuff or maybe prohibition related. We did find old bottles of liquor in the walls when we remodeled and I imagine it was an easy way for people to transport moonshine or the like. When I was a senior in high school, I was sitting on my back porch with a friend, drinking and smoking cigarettes, when suddenly she got quiet. After a moment she turned to me and asked, where does that window go? I'd lived in this house for five years at this point and had never noticed an extra window on the back of my house. Amazingly, neither had anyone else in my family. The backyard was pretty overgrown and we almost never spent any time there. I pretty quickly determined that the window had to be located behind the wall of our hall bathroom shower, but it was locked from the inside and seemed to be nailed shut as well. What could possibly be hidden inside that wall? Why would you seal up a window from the inside but leave it completely accessible from the back of the house? It didn't make sense. This naturally became a topic of intense speculation for me and the friends I had over to drink every time mum was out of town. There must be a body, or catch of old documents, or pirate gold back there, but alas, we couldn't get inside without breaking the window, and I wasn't willing to vandalize my own home to satisfy my curiosity. Ten years later, the house was in serious need of renovations to include a complete remodel of the whole bathroom, and I finally got my chance. Time had done nothing but sharpen my curiosity about the mystery sealed wall, and I knocked down the tiles and broke through the drywall. A thousand possibilities raced through my mind. Jimmy Hoffa could be hidden back there, or an original copy of the Declaration of Independence, or quite possibly the Holy Grail itself. Barely able to contain my excitement, I ripped a huge chunk of the wall with nothing but my gloved hands, finally revealing the long forgotten window and a bunch of moldy pink insulation. Some mysteries are better left unsolved, kids. I used to run a Cub Scout pack years ago. And one weekend we were camping at a Scout Association run camp. It was about 2 a.m. on the Saturday morning and I was woken up by one of the boys screaming. It was a really loud, really terrified scream. I crashed out of my tent and as I ran to where the boys were, a row of dumb tents with four boys in each, when the screaming stopped, I was looking for a tiger or something dragging a cub scout out and devouring him. Not that we get tigers in southeast London, but the screaming had been that terrible. But there was just silence. No other kids had awoken, but I'd been joined by the other two leaders, equally worried and mystified. I couldn't believe that the other boys hadn't woken up, or that there wasn't anyone crying, but just silence. We still had the same number of boys in the morning. It didn't happen again, and we never did find out where that voice was coming from. When I was in sixth grade, 
I went to some apartment complexes with two friends and it was crazy. The whole thing was pretty much a normal apartment complex and then the place we went was a friend of a friend's mum's apartment. I think he owned it or something. It was super big, probably like five plus apartments worth. I remember the layout was strange. You entered and you got into the kitchen straight ahead and to the right was a hallway. The kitchen had like a teacup for the dining area. Down the hallway, I don't really remember what was inside there, probably his room or something. At the end though, there were stairs leading to the bottom floor. In there, you opened an airplane door and were literally inside of a plane. There was a projector inside and we got to watch a movie in there. Next, there was another door in the plane that led to some big area. It was like a big upstairs with an upper floor with a railing and in that floor there was a big cutout to the floor below. On the bottom floor there was a room with a surgery table and was set up to be a scene from the twilight sun. There you would go upstairs and there was some kind of kitchen with a hidden room in the closet. The hidden room led to a giant stage with no bottom seats, only upper seating. Then stairs to get down. Then the seats led to some other things where it was another little hidden doorway and it was on some railing thing. This must sound super confusing, but the house was sick and so strange. One particular plain evening, I was visiting my grandparents with my family. My grandparents lived in what I could accurately describe as being the middle of nowhere, a little cattle ranch near Moses Lake, Washington, their nearest neighbor, roughly three miles away. I was a young boy at the time interested in video games and fantastic adventures. And as I was laying, drifting off to sleep next to my brother, my thoughts fantasized about being akin to a certain hero of a game I had been enjoying. At some point I was somewhere between awake and asleep, a state I think others might call lucid dreaming. I remember the dream clearly. I was in a dark forest hunting monsters, beasts like werewolves, and as I stood over the corpse of a freshly toppled foe, I looked up at a full moon, and a loud bell rang out, and a voice intoned, Lucifer. I don't know why, but this brought me panic. I tried to quiet the noise, but failed, and the bell and voice rang out again. And suddenly I was awake. I was on the floor of my grandparents' living room, laying next to me my brother, who was sleeping deeply. We were not alone. There was a presence behind me. I could not turn to face it. It radiated terror that I have never felt. I could feel its tension on me. It knew I was awake, and it observed me. It felt as if there was a pressure like a wind from a large three-bladed fan turning. I hadn't the strength to poke my brother and hope he would rouse. I curled into a ball and prayed, though I'm not particularly religious. And the more I prayed and begged for deliverance, the more it tried to invade me. After what could have been hours or minutes, it left in a flash, pausing in my grandparents' room on its departure. I was awake and full of adrenaline and did not manage to fall back asleep. In the morning, the rest of my family seemed to have all had an uneventful night. The full moon from my dreams seemed to overlap with the street lamp. I once found a room in the back of my parents' closet when I was a kid. It was essentially a kid-sized hole cut into the drywall that led to a small room under the stairs leading to the basement. None of us knew it was there. The room was all concrete with some 2x4s stretching across the ceiling and others acting as supporting beams from the stairs. It was totally empty, but it was covered in graffiti from the previous owners. And that is how I learned about curse words.